But yeah, that, that's the other thing that schools in bless their soul, that, that's one of the reasons like the school structure just doesn't really work very well. It's like they teach artists how to do art and you can be successful if that, that's the only thing you want to do is create art. But the moment you start getting into a field like art creation, like games, film, there's it's 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 almost like over prioritizing technical uh, limitations, and oftentimes artists don't want to deal with that. They're like, I don't want to build something with less than five thousand polys. I don't want to have a limitation of a, a five twelve texture, and they don't understand like you can still make compelling content even though you have artistic restrictions. You just have to understand how to bend the rules, how to overlap UV shells, how to repurpose tiling textures to make that limitation into an actual artistic boom. G'day and welcome to another episode of the Andrew Price podcast, the podcast for serious artists. I have a guest whom you may not have ever heard of before, Stephen Hauer, and he has worked, I uh, spent over a decade in the games industry, working on titles like Halo. Um, he worked at Camouflage Studios, developing titles for VR. So in this interview, we talk about a lot of topics, but um, we talk about schools at the start, whether or not schools are a good experience and how to get the most out of it. We then talk about um, his experience uh, working on Halo, what he learned there, um, how production changed depending on uh, company priorities and then uh, developing for VR and some of the many challenges that VR presents. Um, and then we talk about efficient game production and why optimization is so underrated when it comes to creating content. And this applies not just to games, but offline content. If you're just an artist or freelancer, learning how to optimize is an underrated, powerful skill that will put your work above everybody else who doesn't understand it and we talk about how that happens and why it's uh really cool once you figure it out um steven also works with me my company um so this year he uh moved from camouflage studios to polygon and he is now the director of assets at polygon where has where he has been uh essentially streamlining the entire production process making things optimized faster to produce we're now getting out twice if not three times as many assets as we were previously we talk a little bit about that at the end um, but there's a lot in here for a lot of people so i hope you stay for the full thing here is steven well steven why don't we start at the beginning and find out how did you first get into game development that is a good question yeah so uh, I was born and raised in Montana. Um, I grew up on cartoons like so many people my generation. And uh, a recruiter actually came out to Great Falls one day and said, hey, did you know that there's a place called uh, the Art Institute of Seattle and you can learn how to make games and film? So that, that was kind of like the beginning of my journey. And uh, I think it was around two, well, 1998, 99 time frame. Um, that's when I met the recruiter and I was like, you know what? I like art. Um, it's something I'm very passionate about. Might as well give this whole digital media a try. And that's right around the time I moved out to Seattle to go to the Art Institute of Seattle. Um, at the time, the curriculum was called the, uh, how did they classify? It was very, it was very ambiguous. Like they were trying to make a very broad net to appeal to as many people as possible. So I think at the time it was called Art Animation and Design. Um, and the, mm. the degree was really focused on teaching you how to do traditional design, um, digital media, and then also web-based media. And then halfway through the course, you had to decide which direction in your career you wanted to go. Mm. I knew almost immediately it was either going to be film or games for me, simply because like, I played games my entire life. I was a huge uh, RPG, Final Fantasy nerd. Um, so that was always kind of like a dream for me to kind of get into that realm. Um, and then I also, what, what, what I mean, year was this? Like when you <clears throat> like, just so that I can place yeah. it as around the time, the games that are coming out at what that era? Uh, the, so when I actually started school it was 2000 to 2003, I believe, I believe that's when I graduated mm. was 2003. Um, right. and it was, it was a show, associate's degree. Um, and pretty much the, the goal of that school was get you in, teach you the, bare minimum when it came to asset creation, art creation, and then spit you into the workforce. So it was very structured and focused on art. And that's exactly what I wanted. I didn't want to go to 
a college and do all these gen ed classes, even though I had to do a certain number of those. Um, I just wanted to focus on art and then get into the workforce because I already kind of knew what I wanted to do. Um, mm. the, the real question was, is could I actually, I mean, put things in the context before I actually went to college? I never owned a PC. My mom thought she was buying a, this is sad. <laughs> Bless my mom. Uh, she, she thought she was buying me a PC in, in uh, high school and she bought what was called a word processor. And let me tell you what, a word processor is just a fancy term for an electronic keyboard, like a typewriter. The screen was black oh, and no. green, and all you could do was word processing and typing like documents. So I was like, Mom, I love you so much. This is exactly what I wanted, even though it wasn't. A PC. <laughs> oh, that's um, sweet. <laughs> but I, I, tried to, I tried to make her feel as good and like fuzzy as possible. But yeah, it wasn't until I actually went to college where I could actually uh, get some scholarships, and then I was able to buy my first PC. Um, and I think I probably made the worst decision you could ever make. I didn't know much about PCs. I bought myself back in the day. It was called Compaq, where like it was pretty much like the smallest computer you could find. And they, they advertised like, oh, the PC for everyone. And then what you find out after the fact is you can't update it. Um, everything's kind of soldered in. Um, and you're kind of uh, locked into this archaic hardware format that they were able to build cheap because they were getting like three-year-old technology to put into these compact computers. And that's what you use. Oh so, my God. Wow. So, so you were at university. Journey. So yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, actually, would you, yeah. was university good for you in your experience? Um, it was good for me in the sense that it put me into a group of like-minded individuals that had a similar passion. And that was pretty mm -hmm. much it. Um, the classes were very, very rudimentary. Um, I pretty much, like I tell my friends and my colleagues, like I pretty much taught myself, like once the second week passed, I pretty much knew the entire curriculum that the teacher was teaching because like I would just burn through the content. And then at that point in time, I was, it sounds weird to say, I was kind of teaching my peers around me how to do 3D art because I already knew more than the teacher. Um, mm. What I found in the Art Institute of Seattle is they were not actually hiring uh, educators at a fast enough rate with regards to keeping up with technology. So the person that was actually teaching me 3D was originally teaching um, theater at the school, but then they phased out theater and they're like, what else can you do? And he was like, well, I, I've always liked the idea of doing 3D. And they're like, you know what, good oh, job. No, really? Here's a book called the, uh, I think it was the 3D <sighs> Bible. And they're like, just learn this, teach this curriculum, and then provided that you can teach this in an effective manner, you can have this job. Um, so as you can imagine, and he was I, learning the curriculum I've heard that's actually we more doing common it. than most people think. Like I yeah. heard the worst one, it was at a convention and I was talking to this guy, like fresh faced kid, like basically he was uh, 20 years old mm -hmm. um, and he says he's teaching 3D at this uh, mm -hmm. this university in, in uh, New South Wales in Australia. And I was like, well, you're, you're pretty young. Like, so mm -hmm. what, what, what's your experience? He's like, well, I actually went to school at that school. And then when I graduated, they said, do you want to teach the next class? And so I said, oh, no. yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you went through a course. They basically trained you in how to teach, like, like, it, like nothing. I, I, I was gobsmacked. And e even he was gobsmacked. He was like sort of cringing, telling me he's like, yeah, it's, it's not great for the students. <laughs> no, it's like, oh, that's terrible. And it can't yeah. be. And the, the sad yeah. thing is, like, I see that time and time again. I've, like, talked to a lot of people. I've actually had to mentor a lot of people over my career. And it's a very common thing where, like, people just kind of get thrown in positions that they're unqualified for. They do mm -hmm. the best they can. Like, I, I appreciate that aspect. I understand that they're trying and they're trying to survive. But it's a complete disingenuine approach from the school saying, like, this is going to get you ready for the industry because it almost never does. Yeah. Um, the, the, ver the people that end up succeeding end up putting like OT, Buko OT in and end up learning all so much more outside the class than anyone else. And that's why they thrive. That's why they succeed is because they just have passion. And frankly, most people just don't have any options. So they just know they have to work day and night to be able to get their foot in the door. And it's those people mm -hmm. that end up succeeding in my experience. Yeah. 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 One of the best pieces of advice that I've recorded in one of my interviews was Colin Levy. He said that he went to school at uh, SCAD, 
the Savannah mm-hmm. College of Art and Design, I guess is what it stands for. And um, yeah, he said basically there was, it was like a re- it's a really good college. It's like one of the top ranking if you go on like the rookies, which ranks oh, yeah. uh, colleges in terms of actually getting, teaching students good, good design and art skills. Um, it does rank very highly, but he said like even there, like the best students, um, he, he said basically you, you should learn so much on the side of going to your curriculum that it's as if you are self-taught as in like you're going to class like nine to five, but in the evenings you're learning even so much more that it would be the equivalent as if you were self-taught. You need to have that mindset when you go to university. Um, yep. and, and also and like something else I heard like Proco say, I don't know if you know Proco, the YouTube channel. Um, but he, he mentioned like, it, it's true that college gives you like a curriculum. It's good to have that, like that map that, of like, mm-hmm. this is what you need to learn in this order. But your learning doesn't stop at the end. So some people say that they prefer college because it gives you a curriculum. But when you finish college, you have to keep learning. So you have to learn how to self-learn eventually anyway, which is also true, I think. No, absolutely. Um, And that's what the schools really should be focusing on is teaching you how to find out current trends and teach you how to learn that stuff. They should be teaching you Go to SIGGRAPH papers that have been released. Go to GDC papers. You don't even have to go to the convention. There's like all this, re- all these resources at your disposal that will teach you how to build amazing content. Mm-hmm. Um, and unfortunately, most schools don't teach you that. They just, I don't know if they just don't know. Um, I like to think a lot of it is ignorance because I don't want to think that they're just intentionally taking money from people. Um, yeah. But there's all these resources that you just don't hear about and you find out after the fact and oftentimes years after the fact you're like so you you're telling me the reason i was unemployed for two years out of school is that no one told me about vendors vendors there's companies that typically they call them kind of like headhunters they they find you positions in the industry based off your skill set and then they market you to places like microsoft to bungie to all these different places and Schools, for whatever reason, don't tell you about that stuff. Like you're solely dependent on that school finding you a job placement or having that right in of doing wow. like a, a job fair yeah. or something like that and having to talk to the right person. Wow. Um, so that's what they really should be doubling down on if they want to actually have retention um, mm-hmm. in my mind. Because I don't know if you have it in like where you went to school, but the school I went to is closed because they couldn't compete with online markets of all these places that give out free educational uh, courses. They couldn't compete with places like, a great example is uh, Guild Wars. Like that, that studio actually has a school that they've rolled out that teaches how to do game development specifically. And hmm. then if you're good at it, you get a job with Guild Wars, right? So hmm. it's, it's pretty much a mentorship that you pay for that eventually if you're, you're very dedicated, you can get a job from. And mm-hmm. these schools like Art Institute of Seattle, just they have such of a draconian legacy format that like, how could you ever compete with a company that is also teaching people how to do the job that you're trying to train people on? And mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's, I think it's, <laughs> I'm gonna be frank, I think it's time. I think most of these schools charge way too much for what they give you. They fold in, uh, once again, all these gen ed classes that are arguably like knowing math is important knowing how to do script writing is important but that's not what you're doing 90 percent of your day if you're an artist you're either in 3d you're in photoshop and I, i'll tell you what most people don't see the correlation between learning how to do basic accounting and balance your checkbooks with regards to how it empowers you to do great concepts and they're completely unrelated so mm, mm, yeah yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it, it is a big field. And it is, it is even a, a, a tough order to say, like, within three years, you'll go from having nothing to being employable in the industry. Mm-hmm. It, it's a, it is a lot. It's a lot of content to learn. But also, if it is taught well and you're learning efficiently, as in you're learning the right thing at the right time, mm-hmm. three years should be possible. But it does require, yeah. Dedication. Uh, I, I, it does sacrifice. require dedication. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Um, but anyways, okay. So you went to this, uh, Seattle school, which is yep. now closed. <laughs> um, yep. what happened after, after you graduated? Uh, so, uh, the last year I was at that school, 
Um, I happened to make a couple colleagues. I did some freelance work there. Most of it was 2D related, like like stupid things. Like people wanted tattoo designs. People wanted uh, a very quick mock-up of what their website could look like. So I was providing people like content. I really wasn't doing what I wanted to do, wow. which was game development at that point in time. Um, you doing website it, designs. <laughs> yeah. Can you believe that? <laughs> That's crazy. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was just doing anything I could uh, to try to make ends meet. And then on top of that, I was working full time at a pizzeria in Seattle called Pagliacci's. And I think they're closed now, too. So it's, <laughs> nice. it's like this, this curtain everywhere I go, like things just closed down. Now that. <laughs> yeah. Beware. Um, but um, <laughs> very morbid. Uh, so like after that, um, I actually just be, like got really, really friendly with the few, um, educators at that school that I felt like they actually knew their work. There's this one educator named Jim Tavernetti. Um, and he was just a very prolific procedural 3d artist. Like he did a lot of like kind of like fractal geometry 3d art that is not really digestible unless you're doing NFTs. Um, mm. and he just like kind of like told me like, hey, you're you're a very talented person. You're very passionate. You have a long way to go with regards to being ready for the industry. But the thing that you do have is you're able to motivate your peers. So anytime you want to take a free course, even after you graduate, come in. So I'd be just like spending all this additional time at the AIS, like sitting in classes with Jim Tavernetti, just kind of like talking openly uh, with my peers and him about like where the industry is going. And then it also kind of like be like a co-tutor in a way for his peers. And he like, we, we had this amazing partnership because like I would push the, the, the um, classmates with regards to this is like, I'm your competition, even though I'm a nice guy at them, they should look at me as your competition. So I'd elevate the, the people in that class with regards to you have to up your standards. And then I'd also mm. speed up their education flow because I'd be bringing in things like, hey, this is how you build topology quickly. This, If you're building um, a vase, think about how you might build it from, it could be um, polygons, it could be splines using lathing, it could be um, trying to use deformers to do the same thing. And I'd bring all these like new kind of skill sets to them and kind of show them like there's more than one ways to do the same task. You just have to find the fastest way because that's how you stay employable. So it was primarily me and uh, Jim Tavernetti working together that really kind of like set the, the stage for me to eventually meet my my first real industry mentor. And his name was Adrian Woods. Uh, Adrian Woods worked for ACES. Um, ACES was a flight simulator uh, owned by Microsoft. And what they did smartly was like they would reach out to schools, set up partnerships with that schools. And what he would do, would do specifically is he would come on site um, have an hour course on, hey, we're looking for people that are interested in building buildings, interested in building props for flight sim. In exchange for this free work that you're doing for us, you're going to be able to say in your resume that you've worked on flight sim. And that paper trail is going to have far more impact for you to find future jobs than just saying, hey, I can do 3D art. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what happened. Like I, I uh, latched onto that, that relationship with uh, Adrian Woods. And he just saw like, hey, Steven's a go-getter. He has a long way to go with regards to his career. And then it, that um, freelance job that wasn't getting paid for it eventually turned into a paid contract with them directly. And then I just ended up getting my first contract position through ACES doing uh, environment work. So I was building buildings. Mm -hmm. I was doing world uh, creation. Like we're talking about world creation. <laughs> we're not talking about a city. We're talking about like, hey, we need you to now build out Paris with two other people and you had to build a bunch of buildings from scratch like the for, play, for flight time. simulator that's what yeah for flight right? simulators specifically yeah yep. yeah and, and what, what uh, version of flight sim just so we know the year yeah yeah is flight sim 10 and then flight sim uh 10 2 which it was like uh, if you're familiar with red bull racing it was like an expansion uh -huh. pack of dlc where you could do red oh, bull okay. racing in specific locations around the world in flight sim um, and then it was ESP, which was uh, ESP was a code name, kind of like a code name, which was a, a military simulation program that Microsoft was trying to. Uh, how would I phrase this so people understand it? They were trying to take flight sim and then rebrand it to the military to see if there's a way to generate additional revenue off that title that the military would pay for. Mm. 
Oh, yeah. so, I see. Okay. Yeah. So what we were trying to do with that uh, modification of Flight Sim was like turn into kind of like, let's say like Unreal before Unreal was really like prominent. It was like we were like, here, you have our engine. You can do world building. You can import your own models. Um, the problem is it was very clunky because that code base was based off of a code base in like the early 90s. And mm. uh, to kind of put things in context, like the second year I was working with Microsoft, that was the first time they actually had a model viewer where you could actually look at a model before it was even compiled into the engine. And I was like, they're, they're very behind the curve at the time, but they're, they're aspirational. Whoa. They had connections with the industry. Um, but yeah, so like, I, I very quickly went from working on games to working on military simulations and needless to say, that was not the realm I wanted to be in. Uh, I was like, I want to do, right. I want to do something fun. Like this seems far too mm. impactful on my day to day, knowing that I might be uh-huh. training people how to terminate other individuals. So <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, that, that's got a way on the mind. I've, I've actually heard that from a few people actually that. They, they got into 3D and then they ended up, you know, designing missiles for <clears throat> Boeing. And then they're like, I just mm-hmm. can't do this. It's, it's too much of a conflict for me, which, you know, yep. which is a fair point. Everyone's different, you know? Yeah. 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 But that, I mean, that being said, I mean, it's, I kind of feel the same way about like uh, industrial design. Like I had the option to do industrial design. I was like, I don't want to do this. Like I, like we're talking about micro, like millimeter precision. Like if I screw up this mm. screw this entire thing could be compromised and I could hurt someone. I was like, this is just way too much pressure. And I was like, well, <laughs> let's just focus on something that is a little bit more artistically focused. And I can like rest at the end of the day that I did not unintentionally hurt someone. In Kill this someone. Process. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so where'd you go from there? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> we're probably going to speed through some things. So I was at Microsoft for roughly 10 years I worked at Aces for, I think it was about five years, somewhere around that line. And then I moved over to the, what they call the R&D division, which is just a very broad term. The R&D division uh, can do a lot of different things at Microsoft. They could be focusing on hardware, software. Where I found myself was I was actually working on the first iteration of the Kinect, um, the Kinect w- released with the Xbox. And we're, we're talking about very early days where uh, the Kinect was actually three different ca- cameras. You'd actually set them up, calibrate, and it could actually do amazing full body tracking. Um, it was actually a very amazing product. And then it had decent uh, voice recognition, but that wasn't the thing that was like the bread and butter. It was really like the motion tracking could do. And then um, some mm-hmm. higher up CEO came in. He was like, I don't have any faith that people are smart enough to calibrate stuff. And now, it, which is funny to kind of look back on because you see like all this calibration with VR nowadays, and you're like, well, people are pretty damn savvy. But anyways, the, the higher up was like, I don't have any uh, confidence in this. So we had to take the three camera skew that we, we had proved out. It was working. We had all the hardware scoped out to be efficient. And then they turned it into a flat bar that suddenly was not able to track really anything. Um, but the voice recognition was really good wow. because out of like everything that it could do, that was the superior thing at that point in time because the, the guy pretty much nerfed the hardware. Um, after I saw what happened wow. on the R&D side of things, I was like, okay, well, if I can spend... I think I spent about a year on that team and to have someone that I don't even know (laughs) come in and completely change the entire like framework of what we worked on to kind of prove out like overnight and just kind of make one holistic decision. I was like, this is the wrong place for me. Um, At that point in time, I left the R&D division and I went over to 343 work on Halo 4 in the beginning of Halo 5. I was an environment artist and... uh, that was uh, chaos by itself. It was super fun. Let me be clear. Like that team, probably the most talented group of individuals I've ever worked with. But that being said, it was also a group of like 500 artists, people from all over the place. We had mm. people from id. We had people from Naughty Dog. We had people from pretty much every major studio you could find around the world working on Halo 4 and Halo 5. Um, and wow. it was just a very enjoyable experience when it came to... Um, your peers like if you wanted to learn something you had people at your disposal to be able to learn pretty much anything you wanted to from organic modeling to sculpting it was really the the first game i worked on where zbrush was used pretty much from the start of the production to the end of production um on other projects i worked on oh yeah on other projects i worked on they'd be like working on things kind of like in isolation like okay this one asset might be zbrush but the rest of the assets were just hard surface model 
um because i didn't see the value in it but like that's you really just double downed on art has to be the showcase on this we have to prove to the industry that mm. even though bungie's not making this game we can still make high quality content and it was really a blank check that microsoft wrote to that studio to um provide the community confidence that this franchise was this franchise was actually in good hands um mm. so to their credit like i learned a ton i love the people i worked with but i i think it just boiled back kind of back to the microsoft model is that um, there were several pivotal decisions during Halo 4 that started to like raise some red flags with regards to game production. And we had these higher-ups play the game. And they're like, hey, we don't believe, and it's completely insane to think about that. They were like, we don't believe that um, 90% of the, the industry will actually get to the end of the game. So we're going to cut the, the last fight sequence, the last boss battle. We're going to remove all the resources, uh, like meaning... When I say resources, I mean, I'm talking about tech artists. We're talking about AI programmers. Um, they pretty much just came in and said, like, we're, you're not getting these resources to work on this last level. Um, and it's solely an art effort to kind of get things wrapped up. And then we're turning the last battle into a, a turn-based event, meaning you hit X at this moment, you hit X at this moment, and then you beat the bad guy. Um, and it was based off statistics. They just kind of looked at the numbers, and they just someone higher up just said, we don't have faith that most people will finish this game, so why bother making a, a fun, compelling ending to this product? <clears throat> and Whoa. it was just shocking to me. As, For Halo. Yeah, Halo 4. Um, and that has, like, one of the most, like, devoted communities yeah. in the game community, right? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. That's cra- so, so the fans love that. Obviously. Oh, no, they hate it, <laughs> as you can imagine. <laughs> Sarcasm is thick in this conversation. Um, no, no, like, right, there right. was a huge amount of backlash and it was no fault of the artist. Like we, we told time and time again, our, our, our higher ups, like this is a problem. You guys can't be doing this. Like we're, we're trying to prove to the community that we can build this amazing game. You guys are hamstring us. And they were like, yeah, we don't care. We'd rather spend that money on marketing. So they pretty much took the budget that we had and bought a blimp put it into the UK above Big Ben, I think it was, and put the Didact symbol on it. And they didn't say anything else. So people had to kind of guess what the intent of that, that blimp was. And then they rented out someplace in... Um, that was the marketing effort? Yes. <laughs> they rented out some town. Wait, hang on. So it, they rented a blimp in London? Yes. And it said Didact? No, it didn't even, it didn't even didact? say Didact. It just had an icon of the Didact symbol, which is... Think of a, um, a stop sign with a line that comes out one end. So it's pretty much a, a lines that make up a stop sign, then there's a line that goes into the center of it. And if you're a die-hard Halo fan, you know that that was the didact symbol. But no one else knew what it was. Oh. Um, so they were just trying to... So they were kind of like banking on it, like going viral. Exactly. Like, what is this? What's this symbol in the sky? Right. Yeah, and that just, but really, it was just a waste. It was just a waste. <laughs> it, was, it fell flat. And then another thing they did was apparently someone had the bright idea that, and I won't even be able to remember anything, but apparently you can rent out towns. You can, you can pay a certain amount of money. You can rent out a town. And then everyone in that town, you can pretty much do whatever you want with. So what they did was they rented out this town <laughs> somewhere abroad. What? And then they had uh, a guy dress up as Master Chief. And they had a lot of these citizens dress up in like... Uh, uh, USEC gear and they just tried to shoot a bunch of promo videos like hey look what we did we rented out a town like this is Halo and they're just trying to have like this huge buzz and once again this hoping it would go viral and it didn't so they're just like they were just grasping uh, at straws just trying to figure out how do you market this product because uh, weird weird marketing business models that Microsoft has like, for instance, they have preferred vendors, and if you want to have a marketing effort, you have to use these preferred vendors, even though they don't actually understand how to market a video game. They're really good at marketing Windows. Whoa. They're really good at marketing, like, other, like, software that Microsoft makes from, like, a, a, a Word and that kind of stuff. But then you would end up, unfortunately, getting that same group trying to market your game, which is Halo 4. And it's just maddening. <clears throat> That's... Uh... That's tough. I mean, the agency tried to make that. That's the thing. Like everybody sees a viral video, and everyone goes, "Like, how do we get that? Mm-hmm. How do we get our brand represented in this thing?" Which is like, 
endlessly free advertised across news stations, Reddit, YouTube. Everybody sees it and you don't have to pay for it. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's what everybody wants. Yes. And unfortunately, what makes something go viral is very, very hard to pick. <laughs> yes. And even a great idea can just be poorly executed on the day or, or it can go the opposite direction. Like the, uh, was it that Pepsi ad that went viral uh, <laughs> for the wrong reasons two years ago? I vaguely during the protests. Oh, I vaguely remember that. Yep. Yeah, the things that you don't, you definitely a, do not want to go viral. Jenner or something. Yeah, yeah, and it was like she was like protesting or something, <clears throat> some vague protest, and then gave the policeman a Pepsi can, and everyone went, "This is the worst ad yeah. ever made." <laughs> Apparently, yeah. Pepsi will stop every conflict. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Actually, like now in hindsight, it's like because that became a meme. Like then Pepsi was like actually seen at protests mm -hmm. as a joke. People try to like stop the bro. <laughs> but like I don't know, was it actually <clears throat> good for them? like they might have actually got a lot of uh, free press from. I think I, I, I think uh, I mean <laughs> Pepsi's still around, right? So I think the the out initial outcome was not what they expected. I think they expected all these sales and yeah. there's backlash and there's a PR nightmare. But I think as you just kind yeah. of alluded to. It became a meme, and eventually they probably end up making the revenue back because that meme became popular by itself, probably like spearheaded by some poor artist that was like, hey, I'm just going to like run with this thing. And then he ended up unintentionally driving up the, the revenue of Pepsi because he was doing all these like random events. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is, That's it. it. It's random events. It's like trying to predict, like, if we move the planets of this system that we don't understand, can we create an eclipse? Mm -hmm. It's like, maybe. That's what virality seems like. Yeah. Yes. And even even people who do YouTube, like, I've spoken to so many YouTubers at events and things, like big ones, and they all say the same thing. My most popular video was the one that I least expected. Hmm. The one that goes viral is not the one that they pin it on. So even people in video that have a close connection to what, what the buzz is just get it completely wrong, hmm. which is like, no wonder the ad agencies failed. I don't know, yeah. I, I'm coming to their, to their saving grace, but yeah. I, I think the blimp was a bad idea. That's oh, I, <laughs> like there was so I can't remember like right offhand, but I just remember hearing about all these amazing pitches that they were considering. And then, like, we heard the blimp, and we're like, well, no one's going to use that. Like, this. And then they used that. We were like, what? Who made this decision? Like, why didn't you talk to us? Like, at least have, like, a survey. Um, but no, they, they just wanted to work in isolation yeah. because they thought they knew better. And, uh, mm. to, I mean, to their credit, like, the, the thing that actually killed that company from, like, just, like, the product was just the fact that the Microsoft over-prioritized multiplayer, and they just assume multiplayer is where the industry is going. That's got to be the focus. And they did, really didn't understand that the, the core audience of Halo, uh, and then at least for Halo 4, was story. Like, it was, for me, the reason I played the Halo games was this story. I wanted to understand, like, what were the challenges? Where was Master Chief going? What was his relationship with Cortana? That's why I played those games. It was never for multiplayer. Multiplayer was always like a, a almost like a party event. It's like, hey, I have some friends over. Let's do some multiplayer. Let's just, like, frag each other and be done with it. So I think the people making the decisions just probably shouldn't have been in those positions. And, and it's unfortunate. Like you see that time and time again with like these larger business models where like they just put these people in the position of power that don't fully understand like the IP that they have. And they just kind of like rely on the wrong people to guide them. So mm. um, it's uh, although I can kind of see that I'm, I'm coming to the defense yeah. again. I, I can kind of see where they come from. Because like if you look at like what are the, the, the top performing games in the world right now? They are multiplayer mm -hmm. games with little or sometimes no single player, right? Fortnite, yep. um, <clears throat> Pop 1 on VR. We'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, like that, that don't have a single... So like I remember Valve um, said after Portal 2 that Portal 2 was going to be the last of their games that had a single player element. And people like revolted, mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, this is crazy. But like a lot of games were sort of noticing this trend of like, you know, all this money is spent on this story aspect. And then the thing that actually is the lifeblood of the revenue for the company is this thing that was like almost a throwaway, it seems like, to a lot of games. Like, yeah, we, I guess we should have a multiplayer aspect, let people frag it out. And then that became a huge thing. Yep. Um, 
I, I can kind of see how you could read the data and go like, all right, well then let's ditch the story. But at the same time, stories are important in ways that can't be often quantified, mm -hmm. you know? Like, like why is Disney, like why do people want to go to Disneyland versus a, a, an average theme park? Right, it's like other other th rides that much better at Disneyland versus the rides at the. Th it's like, no. well, no, there's a story. Yeah. It's like, what's the value of the story? It's intangible. It's everything. It's <laughs> you know, it, it's the reason that people are buying the 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 ears and the 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 shirts and the pins and the. It's it's something that drives it, although you can't really quantify it. No, absolutely, um, and I, I don't think they were wrong. Let's be clear, I don't think they were wrong in uh, focusing on multiplayer. It just should not have been at the sacrifice of the 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 campaign um mm, because the right, campaign right. is what draws people in there and the multi people the multiplayer is what keeps them there um yeah. keeps them engaged yeah. especially if you start right. doing dlc um yeah which i think i think uh bungie has done that pretty successfully even though like their games are getting kind of grindy nowadays i think they kind of showed like like no the story is the thing that pulls you there the raids are the thing that like really focus on multiplayer, and then if you really earn multiplayer, you can start doing um, PvP stuff. Um, mm, right, but right. that being said, I think they're starting it, to learn from their mistakes. I'm seeing uh, Halo going right. in a positive direction nowadays. True. Yeah. So what? I, I don't know much about Halo. Mm -hmm. I have I, I, besides playing the first one, you know, fragging my friends mm -hmm. on a Xbox One years ago. So good. Um, Xbox the first one, yeah. not the Xbox One that was... No, 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 yeah. no. Anyway, <laughs> you know, I... first gen. Um, <laughs> but, uh, like, what, they're continuing the series? Yeah, uh, They're they're going very Still similar going? to Destiny uh, 2. Well, Destiny 1 was there, too. Like, they're going uh, more open world, very focused on multiplayer. I believe it's uh, Halo Infinite. I, I no longer work for the company, so it's hard for me to remember exactly where they're at nowadays. Um, but they're right, right. they're just focusing on like let's really focus on the multiplayer aspect. You're in the universe of uh, the Master Chief universe, and let's have all these amazing encounters, very similar to what uh, Bungie is doing with Destiny Two. Um, Got it. And Got it. Uh, right. I, I think they're they're the hardest thing that they have. I think is probably a professional retention. Um, they just have a lot of people that come in that have, are very inspirational. I remember the art director that we had, uh, Kenneth Scott, on Halo 4. I was like, dude, this guy's pushing this IP in a very uh, provocative direction. He had a very, like, interesting eye when it came to art direction. Not necessarily interesting in a bad way. It was just, like, something I didn't think a lot of people saw at that point in time. And then, mm -hmm. unfortunately, okay. just, like, the, the minutia of the, some of the politics at Microsoft eventually drove him out. And then I think that kind of gets back to retention. If you don't have an art director that's there for a long period of time, they're never going to be able to have a huge impact on the IP in a meaningful way. Um, luckily enough, they were able mm -hmm. to uh, find a quick replacement named Sparth. He's been doing a lot of art directing at that company. He's very prolific when it comes to uh, sci-fi art, spaceships. I think most people probably know him. He's the, the most followed artist on ArtStation. Too, oh, is he? he? I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, yeah, Sparth. Yeah. He, he's like one of the heroes, the, the one everyone looks up to yeah the yeah. guy very unique style very unique style and very very smart artist concept artist uh he actually sat right yeah. behind me um on my team and we, oh yeah a super cool guy like uh, ra uh born and raised in the uk and like we just had a lot a lot of long discussions about like his career and he pretty much gave me the most sound advice he was like if you ever want to be a prof like like a really prolific artist you have to, at some point, go to the UK and spend a certain amount of time in some of these older uh, cities because the architecture is just completely different than any of this stuff really? that you're going to see in the United States. You'll get a better understanding of uh, architectural design, interior design that you almost will never be able to experience if you live in the United States and solely based off of the fact that, I mean, some of the oldest buildings in the United States that I've come encounter with are, are maybe like, a hundred years old, years old, if you're lucky. And then there, we we're talking about... Same in Australia. Yeah, there, like in the UK, we're talking about centuries old. I, just, I remember going to Prague. Yeah. And it's like Gothic architecture. And you don't realize the impact that has on you from an artistic standpoint until like you're standing in front of like some of these cathedrals. And you're like, no wonder they're pumping out people it like... Is, um, mm. Oh, I just, I just had his name. He's a hard surface modeler. Um, he's very prolific. He uses, I think blender all the time he just does a lot of boolean operations 
Um, Vitaly? Vitaly, Vitaly Bogorod? Yeah. Uh, and it's no surprise yeah. to me that that guy is so prolific, given the fact where he grew up and giving the, his industrial background. Um, so, uh, I, is he from Prague? Is he? Well, he's he's from the UK region, right? And uh, my understanding is he's done uh, a ton okay. of traveling. So he's just been able to build mm -hmm. up like this mental catalog of shape language that a lot of people in the United States just are not exposed to. Um, mm -hmm. Not that you cannot bridge that gap with a hard, like a lot of hard work. I just think it's like it's it's. One of those unquantifiable things that are hard to pinpoint unless you actually go yep. abroad for yourself and kind of see there and like spend time like doing illustrations, doing uh, form mm -hmm. studies to understand like, oh, this is what I'm missing out on. And then you compound that yeah. with like, what happens if I was here for 20 years? How much different would my art style be based off of all this influence I have? And it, it's, mm, it's, that's it's true. pretty compelling. But it, it, it's also it's also learning to see as well. Like, um, I don't know if you know uh, Kim Jong Gi. Have you heard of that artist? I'm not familiar with he's the artist. A, um, he's an illustrator from South Korea who he's one of the strangest artists. He can draw a like three perspective scene of like characters interacting in like a coffee shop, mm -hmm. super detailed without any sketch lines put down. He'll just <clears> grab <throat> his pen and just start drawing a face, mm -hmm. the head pull it down and then he's like drawing out the bar drawing it it's like and he basically uh all his life has just been everywhere he goes just studying things with his eyes mm -hmm. and just looking at like, i watched this interview um he said like he, he was in the military because all south koreans have to do a mandatory i think two years of service yep. now i think that's right um and he just you know be sitting in like a, a carrier or something and he, you know anyone who's been in the military knows it's it's sit around and wait that's the job mm -hmm. that's what they call it. hurry up and wait and you just and he would just like sit there and like study all of the individual elements the helmets the things dangling from the thing the thing and just like close his eyes and try to like re-see it and try and reimagine where everything was reopen it to try to uh see if it was correct mm -hmm. which is it's very challenging like something you can do to test yourself um that i learned from talking with uh, ben morrow is uh try to draw something from uh from scratch like say for example a jeep or a camel or something like that so you go all right i'm going to draw a camel and you draw it best from your imagination no reference photo and then you pull up a reference photo and you see what you got wrong then you draw it again from the reference photo okay then you put the reference photo away and you draw it a third time uh from your imagination again to see what you could in and then basically compare it with your first one. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's really challenging. It's, it's surprising. Like you think like, yeah, I know what that looks like, but like I, I do it actually with my kids. <clears throat> Cause like they sometimes just want to like, like draw Elsa for me. And I'm like, Elsa, Elsa, oh, what the hell is she wearing? What is it? What is her hair? Like, <laughs> you know, like is she wearing a crown? Like I, I have no idea. Like I can't like even like a simple thing, like bluey this uh, cartoon show huh? simple blocky shapes of a dog it's like what does a dog look like I, I can't even remember oh yeah you have to pull it up and then i put it on my phone and i'm like oh my god i got it totally wrong i had no idea what it looked like until i saw it again how did your uh, uh, kids react but yeah learning to see oh i mean they think it's yeah. awesome they're like yay blue you know and it's like this blobby shape you know well, they're, they're, they're able to see the intent and they're probably able to see enough characteristics they're like yeah that that's exactly what i meant <laughs> yeah mm. but also they're four and two like they're barely drawing like they can barely draw a, a stick figure yeah. so like anything i do is amazing to yeah them. they're just happy to be in the same room <laughs> as you yeah the, yeah i mean when they get older i'm sure they'll hate oh. me you know <laughs> let's, let's not go down that path i have a teenage daughter and she doesn't hate me but like man like they grew up so fast um uh, it's different yeah <clears throat> but yeah probably yeah. the the, looking forward to the that. most important thing i ever learned because i used to do a ton of illustrations concept work before i got into 3d the most important thing that i learned um it was either the end of high school beginning of college was like the 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 subject matter you're trying to draw oftentimes is less important than the negative space that they embody um so oftentimes if you just remember mm. that shape like that silhouette, like for me, like for instance, like if you were to look at my silhouettes and like how that conforms to the background, if you were to draw that, that'd be actually a more accurate representation of me than just trying to draw me initially. Yes. Because <clears throat> you're looking at, That's, you're, and, you're yeah. looking at relationships 
And uh, oftentimes, mm -hmm. like if you just like try to draw a human being, you're like, okay, I'm just going to draw a head and then I'm going to try to figure out the relationships of the eyes. But if you screw up the head, because you're not looking at the relationship of the head in context of something else to understand what is actually the sh shape of the head, you're, you don't have yeah. a strong foundation. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <clears throat> and yeah, that, there's a couple of books on drawing from the right side of the brain that sort of teaches you basically the lesson, draw what you see, not draw what you think. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's super common. You don't think you do it, but when you're drawing from reference, if you've got like a, a person there or something, you could be drawing from the reference, but you, you're still, you're identifying shapes. I'm drawing the head. So the jaw looks like this, even though you've got the reference there and you're going back and yeah. forth, it's, <laughs> you end up drawing something that is totally off the proportions or the shapes that's in the reference that is right there and you're getting it wrong. Yeah. And so what uh, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, uh, the book, which is probably, it's not a fantastic book, but for different reasons. But anyways, it teaches you one exercise, which is draw the, flip the picture vertically. So draw it upside down. And you do it and you nail it. What? Which is scary. Yeah, if, you, if, like, if you're trying to draw like a character like that, you end up with something all skew-ift. You flip it upside down and you draw it upside down and you nail it because your brain can't identify the shapes. Mm -hmm. So it has to rely on what it can actually see. That is brilliant. Like the neck goes up and it stops about there, which is exactly, because I don't know what, like how long is a neck? I, I don't identify that I'm doing a neck. I'm just looking at shapes. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's kind of like, it's more of just an exercise to show you like how wrong you can, your, your brain will force you to, it's uh, the per when you're drawing, if you're, if you're, identifying shapes you'll draw it a different way yep. than if you're just seeing and copying which is uh no that's brilliant i love that i mean that's one of the reasons like so many artists uh like and i also suggest that just like f flip your image like left and right uh change the values remove the color from it occasionally just so you can kind of get it like you can untrain your eye so you can be more mm -hmm. um judgmental and have a, a clearer perspective of like what you're drawing so the fact that like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um I've never tried, I should try it out, like trying to draw something upside down makes complete sense because once again, like as you mentioned, you're then focusing on the shape language and the relationships as opposed to what your mind thinks this should be. And that, that's the biggest mm -hmm. battle with art is like, <laughs> don't, don't allow your mind to uh, fill in the blank if you're trying to do accurate portrayals of something. Like you need to be critical from the start to the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Yeah. Um, Anyways, we sort of went on yeah, a tangent. Um, what happened? Uh, so, so you were at Microsoft <clears throat> for 10 years. Yep. Where did you go from there? Yeah, so at the end of Halo 4, beginning of the R&D division, or R&D kind of like effort of Halo 5, um, I was doing a lot of like kind of like documentation. It wasn't really doing art anymore. And that's no, almost always the time that people like abandon ship if they're going to like try something else out. Uh, right around that time, I ended up meeting um, an X343 uh, a director named Ryan Payton, and he was starting up his own team called Camouflage. Camouflage was a brand new company. Mm. They were, uh, I think they just recently did a Kickstarter funding round, and they just recently got some funding from that. And they were looking to make um, a mobile game that was uh, episodic, like they wanted to try an episodic model, and they wanted it to be five episodes. Um, and they, they were having a hard time because like all they had were kids, uh, people right out of school that didn't really understand art production, that really didn't understand production at all. Um, and they were like, hey, we're looking for someone to come into the team as an art director, as a technical director, as someone who can also like kind of like mentor and guide this team of aspiring artists on how to build a game correctly for um, a mobile device. At the time, I think it was like iPhone 3 or 4 or something like that. And I was like, you know what? It seems like a risk. I could stay at 343, probably be successful in my career. Um, but at that point in time, I was kind of done with Microsoft. I, I saw how they kind of murdered Halo 4 in my, at least my eyes. Um, and I was like, you know what? I could stay here and be successful. Or I could try something else that's fairly risky. And I've always really enjoyed, even like back when I was working with uh, Jim Tavernetti at school, I always liked the idea of having more of a mentor role and educating people. That's something I found a lot of value in and satisfaction in. And this sound, sounded like something, like a continuation of that. Um, so I left 343, kept in ties with a couple of the uh, artists there that I, I found to be very like aspirational. Paul Papera, 
uh, Kenneth Scott and so forth. And then I just kind of like went out on my own as the art director for Camouflage. Um, mm. we, we worked on a bunch of different titles. Some of them shipped, some of them didn't. Um, we we uh, initially released uh, Republic episodes one through five on mobile, and then they ported that to. <laughs> it feels like every every hardware you can think of that is a game hardware, they've ported that game to. And I'm like, wow, this game oh, is really? probably wow. on more uh, hardware SKUs platforms than any other game I think I've ever worked on. What's the game title again? It's sorry? called Republic. Um, the Republic. Yes. So the idea is telling me the name of it. Yeah, um, you're a hacker. You're hacking into this establishment, um, and you're helping this girl named Hope out of this uh, this building. So you're pretty much uh, giving her guidelines by clicking on the screen, telling her like, "Hey, this is a safe area. Go here." Uh, Ryan Payton was very, very influenced uh, with uh, Metal Gear Solid. So the gameplay loop is very similar to that. You're, you're not shooting stuff, but the idea of like sneaking to these locations, getting uh, gear to incapacitate bad guys. Um, but the goal is not killing them. The goal is escape from this area and get her out of this uh, compound, more or less. Mm, um, right, so right. the big okay. the big challenge there is like a, lot, a lot of different challenges. One, like the funding, teaching a, a team that was uneducated and unproven with regards to shipping a title on like, this is how you build artwork helping them understand uh, PBR, which most of them didn't understand PBR. Like it was like pretty much the foundation of PBR. I think it was uh, right at the end of episode one, we switched the entire game, had to rebuild all of our artwork for physical based rendering because that became the new standard. Really? Um, wow. And this was like 2016, <clears throat> 2015. Let me think about it. So I started there officially 2012 episode one released, I think 20, 14, 2015, I think. And then we had to report okay. it to, uh, we had to convert it to PBR. I think the PBR was around 2015, 2016 timeframe. Yeah. 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 Got it. Got it. Right. And then, yeah, that was a, I remember that sort of taking off. Like it was just one of those like terms that just pops up in forums and like, Oh, is it PBR? Yeah. And like, what's PBR? PBR is the thing, yeah. man. It's the, come on, ride the way. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, what is you're it? You're not building a game unless it's PBR. And you're like, Oh God, apparently I have yeah, to do this that's now. Right. Um, that's right. Substance did a really good job. Algorithmic. Oh, so good. Um, really teaching everyone. Cause they had that, uh, PBR Bible. Mm -hmm. I think they, they put together, which was yeah. Really, really helpful for understanding. Oh, absolutely. Wes uh, McDermott, yeah. like, bless his soul. I actually had him on the phone several times. I had actually quite a few meetings with him, like, from an educational standpoint. I'm like, what are we doing wrong? What should we be changing from a pipeline standpoint? And oh, I, I'd wow, say he was true. pivotal with regards to helping me onboard a lot of the team members with regards to the correct ways of building content. Um, because, uh, you, you know this, like, you work with artists, and, like, artists just think, like, if I'm given a texture, I can do anything I want with it. And it was very hard to educate right. people or like retrain people <laughs> like, no, no, there, there's, there's this new thing called there's artistic maps, which are like the color maps, like the albedo map or base map. But then there's also data driven maps that you do not want to do that with, like metallic maps, normal mm -hmm. maps, displacement maps. These are all data driven maps. And a lot of people are just like confused. Like, why, what do you mean? I can't go in here and just like put any value I want. And you just had to like train them over the course of time. Like. Data means you have to use a very specific value if you want it to react correctly. And if you don't use that value, it's not physically accurate. So um, a lot of it is like kind of retraining people as to how to author content in a very kind of very technical way. Um, and I have to admit, like, I was very impressed. Like, well, the moment uh, I think a Pixar GGX model came out, because I think they were the ones that pioneered the whole PBR uh, thing, they released that paperwork, and everyone's, like, minds were blown with regards to this is how artwork should be done. It's more predictable. Mm -hmm. I now just have to worry about the lighting uh, model that I have. I don't have to worry about like how my texture is going to change if it's in a light environment, a dark environment. And it, it really mm -hmm. just like kind of like, kind of like give, gave, like revi revitalized my respect for the craft. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think it's a, an underrated skill is learning um, when to deviate artistically mm -hmm. um break rules yes you know because i on one end you've got people who are like uh, no it, it, everything's an art form i can do whatever i want with the maps mm -hmm. and it's like there are downsides to that and you don't realize what they are 
And then there are other people which is like, no, everything has to be physically accurate. Everything has to like, do not touch this. Like this value has to be exact. Yes. And it's like, yeah, but it it's causing this other thing. It's like you can't touch it. You know, yep. <laughs> and it's like it's, there are two sort of extremes. So you have to know sort of what that is. So like one, you know, one example, right? Like you're not supposed to touch the spec map, mm -hmm. right? Nowadays for the the PBR thing, it's supposed to be roughness driven. Anything if if you turn up the roughness enough, and if it's dark enough, then that should really that the speculars should cancel out. But there will be times where you'll still get light in an area where there shouldn't be, in which case you do need to crush that spec value. You need to turn it down. Yeah. But you have to know when to use it. Because if you just start opening up you know, your material and then first thing you do is drag down the spec value, you're doing things you don't know are sort of, you're gonna end up fighting it in the future. Because yes. now you're gonna make the spec map shinier because it's not feeling uh, reflective enough when really it's because you messed with the reflective value early. Yep. Um, and I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. The, 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 probably the, the best advice I could give to anyone learning PBR is learn the, 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 learn the mechanics of PBR. And once you feel like you're, you're very competent and you understand the relationship of each map to each other, you can start bending the rules. You just have to realize that you might be end up, like as you mentioned, like if you're changing your spec map, you just have to realize that if you're putting that asset into a lot of different lighting models, it's probably not going to react predictably anymore. And that's the whole point of a PBR yeah. pipeline is that you get that predictability f when you light your content. Um, and a lot of people that go into it, like, and I, I, I completely agree. I, I find myself like right in the middle. Like I'm not a zealot, but I do feel like you have to understand the intent of what you're doing and how it relates to the final product. So you understand the, the outcome and how it's gonna be used. And what I tell people yeah. from a production standpoint, like if you're in a production pipeline, Try not to bend those rules too much because you don't know how that content is going to be used. You might build an asset for one level and then it's used in 15 different levels and people are coming back to you like there's bugs on this asset because it's not authored physically accurate. Um, however, if you're doing your own work, you're doing freelance work, the end goal is just making an illustration oftentimes for that single skew. And if you have that level of predictability, you can kind of do whatever you want as long as the final illustration looks solid. Um, mm, but that's the difference yeah, of yeah. freelance, kind of like things in isolation and a production mentality. Production, you don't have that level mm. of freedom because you never really know how people are going to use your content after you hand it off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, especially for assets that are, yeah, integral or reused throughout the game. If you mess with a value, it's like just to make it so it looks good under this lamp. It's like, well, what about when it goes outside? Yes. You know? <laughs> well, that's not yeah. on my level. I don't have to worry yeah. about it. Like, well, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, cool. So, uh, so you, you were developing Republic, uh, the, and was that a fairly successful game? I remember you telling me it was, um, so it, it sold a lot of copies. The problem is, is that the production length of that product was too long. Um, originally we were supposed to have the entire game done, uh, episodes one through five, I think in a year and a half. Um, but the uh, narrative, the director of the company weren't willing to scope down. So that production cycle went from a year and a half closer to four and a half years, if I, if I remember correctly. So they actually didn't, wow. even though it sold a four lot of five episodes, yeah, even though it sold a lot of copies and we, we sold a lot of like episodes and people kept on buying the episodic adventure, they didn't recently, they didn't break even until recently. Like we're talking about mm. almost eight years after the fact, they didn't break even. And it's solely because like wow. they were just like too focused on like this, this long compelling adventure and trying to, how to phrase it? There's like this fear of letting the people go. And there's this fear that, hey, if someone's paying for this, they have to, we have to go above and beyond to justify their purchase. And uh, I think that makes sense in a lot of ways, but it's definitely not a good business model when you do that because you kind of overextend yourself. So because of- You, you mean <clears throat> like the, the customer giving you money? Yes, exactly. And you want to deliver on yeah, that. Yeah, the, right. the, and I, uh, Ryan P P Payton, bless his soul, like he, he loves his community. He doesn't want to ever put the community in this uh, compromising position. So he tends to over-prioritize volume over like quality and like a kind of truncated experience. So- in my mind, and this was like, I mean, this is no surprise. We've, we've did a lot of like dev diaries and that kind of stuff uh, on that product. Um, in my mind, we could have released that game on time within budget and still had a very compelling product. But in his mind, mm -hmm. if we didn't give him the experience that he ultimately shipped, 
people would have felt disenfranchised and they wouldn't, uh, they, there would have been like a tarnished relationship there. And I think partly because like it was Kickstarter funded. So he had all these like um, community backers that he didn't want to let down. So there's like this, there's this relationship between him and these individuals that wasn't healthy from a production standpoint, but it was all for the service of his community and not wanting to let that down. So I understood why it was, why the scope expanded, but it also felt like it wasn't smart business moves at some times. Mm, But, um, so yeah, after that, we, we released that game. Um, and at the time, like after we finished the final episode, we saw that it wasn't going to be like this huge blockbuster hit. And like I was mentioned, it wasn't until like eight years later that we actually recouped the cost and we started to generate some additional revenue off that. We then were like in a position like, well, what do we start doing now that that's done? Like that obviously episodic content is interesting, but it's not super profitable. And then right around that time, VR was starting to come out. Um, so we were like, you know what? We have cycles. We, we, we don't know what we're going to do yet. So we started to do tech demos in VR. Um, I think the first tech demo we did was for the HTC Vive, and we just created like a, a, a escape room experience. You were in this room. Okay. We didn't release it, but you were in this room. You're kind of like moving around. You're learning clues about like why you were in this room, and it's kind of creepy. You'd pull up floorboards, and cockroaches would come out. And we were just really learning like <laughs> what not to do and like how creepy you can make a VR experience. And we immediately were like, okay, well, we don't want to go gory, uh, even though there's a lot of people that are really into, um, uh, what is it, Splinter Cell? There's a couple like scary games that are like, like just like traumatizing. And we just like, we talked to uh-huh. the rest of the people in the company, they're like, well, we don't want to do horror. And that's definitely what the experience that we ended with was like felt very horror esque. We're like, okay, well, but we do like oh, VR. Oh, true, right. We do like VR. And uh-huh. the thing uh-huh. that we heard time and time again from every artist that we were, were creating content in this experience is like, this is a game changer. Uh, like the fact that you could pick mm-hmm. up your asset, look at it in, v, uh, in 3D, move it around. We're like, there's something here that you can't really quantify. There's a tactile experience. And this new medium, just being able to like see your artwork in this like three dimensional world kind of took the medium into a new world. And we were like, we were hooked pretty much. We were like, we don't, we don't want to do uh, these 2D games anymore. We want to do VR because like we just saw something there. So at that point in time, we just like started to do a bunch of demos. We started to pitch those demos around, not really knowing what we wanted to do. Uh, our writer, Brendan Murphy, like very prolific writer, bless his soul. I think if I had to quantify, I think he probably wrote like close to 15 brand, brand new unique stories for a VR experience. And we were doing new pitches almost every other week to companies like Microsoft, to companies like Sony just trying to get a contract signed so we'd have something to uh, jump onto. Um, Because at that point in time, we had like, we had a roadway with regards to uh, financial budget. We were comfortable for a while, but we knew that was going to dry up. So we had to find another uh, job or contract that was going to pay us to produce something else. Uh, And I think it was probably about, I want to say it was probably about two years after Republic uh, released, we finally signed a contract, and it, people know of it now, is Iron Man VR. Uh, we signed this contract for Iron Man VR, and uh, we just happened to meet the right people at Marvel, um, and we collaborated with Sony to release Iron Man VR on the PlayStation 4, um, PSVR. Wow. And that was, that was amazing. Like, uh, if you feel like working on, like, a big uh, title like... Uh, Halo is a very impactful experience because it is like, once again, like the, the people, your peers, just like the amount you can learn is awe inspiring. Mm-hmm. And then you start working with a company like Marvel and you start seeing like, oh, wow, this is why Marvel hits such a high quality bar and why all the products from film to games are typically such a high production value is that they have a very talented group of internal people reviewing the content, reviewing the story, reviewing the artwork giving meaningful feedback about like, this is how you guys could actually make this experience better. And they really just like kind of taught you like, this is how you make a compelling story driven game and how you make it in meaningful ties in your product that wrap back into, in this case, the comic book franchise of Marvel. Um, mm, and it was just right, right. It, like you, you don't understand like what you're missing until you start talking with people that actually understand the Marvel franchise from start to beginning. And they start calling out like, hey, if you put this number here, 
you're going to have these fanboys calling out this the, this number. And it's just like a number really? like on a, wow. a book, I think. People are like, oh, that's a reference to this comic book back in like the 70s. Oh, that's a reference to this. So that alone ended up generating all this additional buzz about the game um, and end up just like... Oh, really? Right, right. Like giving us like this huge, deep, meaningful tie with the community that... Uh, I mean, I'm a Marvel fan. I love Marvel... Uh, for the longest time, and I'm a huge fan of the films. Just they kind of taught me like that's why they're so successful in this this venture that they've moved into is that they understand that their community are a bunch of fanboys and fangirls, and mm-hmm. they're looking for their mm-hmm. Easter eggs, and they feel uh, vindicated when they actually find those 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 secrets out that no one else sees, like these Easter eggs. So mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. that's a tip for anyone out there making video games. Like if you have a core fan base figure out like what they're into and then start placing Easter eggs in the game. Don't tell anyone about it and they will find that stuff and they will be very vocal about like that experience that they just had. And in most cases that they enjoyed pro tip for artists, learn how to use your time efficiently. If you are spending time making a shader that you've already built a hundred times before, that is time not spent somewhere else. More important. Polygon solves this by giving you access to over 5,000 assets which are plug and play. Shaders, models, and HDRIs that are created to a reliable, consistent standard so you don't have to waste any time fixing them. And with our new Blender add-on, you can search, download, and import assets directly into your scene from your sidebar, meaning you can keep your focus where it needs to be, which is making good art. You can try 100 assets for free by clicking the link in the description or by going to Polygon, P-O-L-I-I-G-O-N.com and signing up for a free account. Right, right. And then they're like, oh, you know, they're one of us. Yes. They're like ultra fans, yes. you know. Meanwhile, it's a Marvel, the huge conglomerations just got like people on payroll going like, here, throw in this Easter egg. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's cool. No, I mean, they definitely get it. Yep. They definitely get it. Um, so that was your first title developing for VR. Yes. The first game we released was that game on VR. Yep. Got it. Got it. So how is developing for VR different than developing for a screen? Yeah. Um, so probably like a lot of this stuff probably isn't going to make sense to people in the industry, but anti-aliasing is a great example. Like when you're developing for a screen, you have heart, stronger hardware, you have the ability to anti-aliasing, you can do s- sub pixel calculations. So you don't get jagged edges on stuff. You don't get specular highlights that are kind of flickering because you don't have enough pixels to render that surface. And Mm-hmm. Um, because of that, you often have to, this kind of goes back to PBR, bend rules to hide aliasing issues because you don't have that hardware uh, capability of being able to have an anti-aliasing model that is high-end enough, like triplanar anti-aliasing is not going to work on a Quest headset. Um, so you oftentimes have to change your methodology on a number of different fronts. One you need to make things rougher than you normally would. Um, and the reason you're making things rough is so you minimize aliasing. Uh, two, you can't um, use a full range when it comes to values. You need to make sure that you're truncating your values. Like if you were to imagine, here's pure black at one, here's pure white at zero, you need to actually cr- crop that in about 20% because most of these uh, LCD screens don't actually have the ability to render past that. So anything that go, exceeds that 20% value, high and low, gets clamped and crushed. So you end up having areas that are too dark. Really? Yeah, and they, they call it ghosting. So you end up having areas that are too dark. And then if you move your head too fast, you see almost like this ghosting or shadow line. And if you have areas too bright, like you just lose all the detail. Like you, you don't see anything in there because oh. you don't have the range, like the HDR range to be able to render that stuff. Uh, Whoa. And that's because the headsets just don't have the same capabilities as a normal screen. Yes. Yeah. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Um, but you were developing for one headset, just the PlayStation VR yes, we were. headset. Yeah. So we were okay. developing, and this is where it gets weird. Like, so we were developing on the PlayStation uh, VR headset, but uh, at the time there was like this hardware shortage. So 
we actually had a fractured team where like only a half of the team actually had PSVR headsets and the other team was using like HTC Vives. And you can imagine like the HTC Vive is far superior to the PlayStation VR. So you'd have people uh, testing out visuals in the Vive. I'm like, yeah, this looks totally fine. Like, I don't understand like what you guys are talking about. And then they'd uh, go to the PlayStation like, oh, yeah. Everything I just authored, the Rangers are way out of uh, whack. Um, I need to recalibrate all these textures to make it actually uh, work correctly on that headset, even though it's no longer physically accurate. Um, uh, it's just one of those things they don't wow. tell you about. And then on top of that, you have to hit 60 frames per second or higher to not make people sick. So you oftentimes have to be building content uh, so optimized that it starts feeling akin to mobile development because the frame rate you hit is king to the visuals because you don't want to get people sick even if you have a dip so so for for, for a screen mm-hmm. what's the typical like frame rate you're trying to hit for uh well if you're doing vr nowadays it's 72 fps uh initially when we were doing iron man vr it was let me think back i think it was 40 and then towards the end of production we had to bump it up to 60 because uh, and I think it was for the right reason. Wow. Sony was pretty much saying, that, like, yeah, even though uh, 40, um, some of the demographic doesn't get sick from this experience, it has to be like 60 if we want this to be scalable enough for enough of the people in the industry, like n- new right. new people into right. VR. Now that, that was their main focus. Is like, and, and what about like a console? Like what's the standard frame rate? Uh, frame most rate? consoles are uh, 30 FPS. Recently with first-person shooters, they've been going to 60 or 120 but that's only recent within the last like two to three years. But most of the games you and I grew right, up for like competitive, yep. right? Yeah. Yep, most yep. of the games that you and I grew up with uh, were 30 FPS. And that was more than enough. Um, I remember playing yeah, all yeah. of Destiny One uh, 30 FPS, and then like one day they released this 60 FPS version. And I don't know if you've ever tried to do like A/B testing, but once you play a game like a first-person shooter at 60 FPS, and you try to go back to 30, you almost get sick. Like your eyes noticeably, yeah, it feels clunky. yeah, your yeah, eyes yeah. noticeably see the shift, and you start seeing the dropped frames to the point where like you, you uh-huh. get headaches, and <laughs> for better or worse, like you're like, okay, yeah. I, I can only play games at 60 FPS now, apparently, because my eyes just have a, uh, adapted to that new frame rate. So right, right, yeah. I, I remember as a kid, like when I was buying my first um, computer and playing Battlefield 1942 rocking out Mm -hmm. on it i played that so So much much. in high school and i was thrilled at 30 Mm -hmm. like that was when i i thought i had like a super piece it can't get any better i could hit 30 i know right because i was going from like 5 10 15 you know to like 30 i was like oh my god this is amazing Mm -hmm. you know um but yeah so okay so vr basically the minimum is uh 60 maybe 72 and i've even heard in interviews and like talks on like what does vr need that it should really be even much higher to like a 90 or 120 to really get rid of it. Why is that? So explain why specifically VR need, like you get motion sickness, Mm -hmm. anything lower than 60. Yeah, your brain is just too smart for its own good. Um, It almost always boils back to (laughs) locomotion. If you're moving around, if you're moving your head, whipping your head around, even like naturally, like like someone says something Mm -hmm. to you in day-to-day conversation, like, that that's a fast movement and oftentimes if you don't have a high enough fresh, uh, refresh rate you'll see clipping you'll see like these hard edges that happen on the screen and then the screen has to refresh and that is enough to break the immersion but that is also enough to make people that have locomotion sickness we're talking about people that get in cars and they're driving around the reason those individuals mm. get sick is oftentimes their eyes cannot uh, it sounds weird to think about eyes from a refresh standpoint their eyes cannot uh, track fast enough and that's why they end up getting sick and vr is no different um mm. and that's why yeah. um early on so many people are doubling down with uh, uh car games like car simulators people are doubling down on space simulators because it kind of goes back to mm-hmm. if i have something static in my periphery like a console uh, a steering wheel Cockpit. you can actually have yeah. lower f- refresh rates for things just outside of that purview like the environment because that stuff suddenly becomes what they call stereo rendering it, it's so far out that it almost looks 2d and you don't need to have as high of a refresh value in that area so people are like hey i'm going to make a car game because i can render faster up close and have lower refresh rates in the background and you're able to make your game look higher fidelity because of that um 
Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's that's smart. I mean, it's you've you've got to use what's available for the time. Like Pixar yep. famously did. That. That's why the first movie was Toy Story, because toys, were, like three D was so primitive that making actual realistic humans just looked horrible. You could see it in their first shorts. Oh, yeah. It was it was ugly. It was nasty. So they're like, well, we'll just make the whole movie about toys because it's much simpler. Mm-hmm. So like, it's a similar <clears throat> thing. The early days of VR. We just have to pick the right subject for the technology. And you have so to be willing to see that. That's, yeah. that's smart. Yeah, and that, that kind of goes back yeah. to, and far too many people overcomplicate things. Like, you're better off knowing your limitations and being creative within those bounds than just being like, okay, I'm going to work, do pie in the sky. I'm just going to build whatever the hell I want to because oftentimes yeah. the, the thing that you have in your head is not going to translate, especially into VR, because of all the hardware limitations. And they're getting better and better every mm. day. I mean... If you have a your a headset plugged into your PC like the Vive, granted you, you can pretty much render whatever you want to as long as you have a blazing fast graphics card. But if you want to have wide uh, scale adoption, like the Quest is trying to like really standardize like like what the iPhone did. It's like hey, peep, this is what a smartphone is. Buy the smartphone, and people eventually got it. If you want to do that successfully from a Quest standpoint, you have to be dumbing down your graphics. You have to go more stylized, and very similar to Pixar. Mm-hmm. You have to build your games like almost like in a very like toy like manner, so people don't fall into that uncanny valley, and so you can also build content efficiently enough to hit that seventy two FPS. Yeah, it is weird that we're almost going back in time with VR mm-hmm. a little bit, like the constraints where, as you said, like it feels like mobile. It, it almost yeah, it kind of feels like kind of like like the top games in VR are like. PlayStation 2, maybe 3 graphics, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, the the, the poly counts, the, the the texture resolution is, uh, it's not there. So, like, pe- people really want, th- th- they go to VR expecting the same Experience. quality of realism as a, as a platform game, I guess. Is that, is that, by the way, how you, would you call it a platform is for screens? Yeah. And then, like... VR, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, so like, they're, they're, they're... Yeah, they're expecting that, that same level. Yeah, I mean, they're both peripheries at the end of the day, but, like, they, they, they do expect that. But you, if you really look at it and analyze it, like, um, the last games on the uh, SNES, like, m- none of them were, like, really 3D. That wasn't really a thing. Um, were vastly superior from a graphical standpoint than the games on the early PlayStation. Like, if you look at the graphics of Final Fantasy VII, I love that game. The... They're horrible. Okay. <laughs> They're horrible. Like cloud, cloud was just like a bunch of cubes moving around, but people were like, you know what? I'm only make this conceit because I know this platform is moving in the, this direction and we have to start using 3D to get to where we know it can be. So there was just like a lot of like mm-hmm. early adopters into that, even though they knew graphically uh, Final Fantasy VII didn't hold up to the visuals of Final Fantasy III or the American version of Final Fantasy III and so forth. But they did it for the sole fact that they, they saw the let it then the tunnel and understood that was a smart compromise. And this always happens with new mm-hmm. technology. Oftentimes new technology comes out, people don't understand it. A bunch of like poor looking games, like poor visuals come out because they're just trying to understand the architecture, they're trying to understand the best way to build for it. And then it's not until about two years after it releases that you start seeing um, parity to what you're used to seeing, or you start seeing yeah, that right. the, the technology increasing to the point where you're actually getting visuals better than what you're used to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it's only something I've learned recently that like every good game basically has been hacked. They'd hacked some component of it to, like even, I, I can't remember where it was, but it's somewhere online, they're talking about how they um, felt like Crash Bandicoot, mm-hmm. right? That they were, uh, the reason that they got Crash Bandicoot to look as good as it did, which is crazy to say, it's like, well, blocky shapes, Mm -hmm. but like as good as it did at the time when nothing else could achieve that level of realism and like a 3D character moving around the way it did. And they were basically, I think I could be misquoting it, but they were like stuffing data into components. Like, because basically there was like buckets Mm -hmm. for like this much for sound, this much for visuals, this much for this. And they were like hacking it. So they were taking up part of the sound budget with the graphics budget Mm -hmm. and they were like pulling from it to like and like it was this really bizarre way to get more data into it but it's how you get that edge is understanding the technical limitations and how to work around it to to fit more into it absolutely um and there's another more 
more recent example with the um, Uncharted 4, how they had the uh, Jeep going down the hill mm -hmm. scene, which is incredible. So like good. the realism of it and the an amount of content that they had there. Um, and this video on um, I IGN, ING? Is IGN, that's the, the, the big gaming yeah, channel. IGN. Um, yeah. But yeah, they, they had like an interview with like the makers of it and they explained like how they were able to like basically segment, like put the content behind, that's why you end up going through fences and things because it, there's a level that's loaded behind it. So you have to like go through something and then they hide it by having the car turn and then they're loading the next part of the level so that when you go into it, so they can have these incredibly dense environments with so much going on in physics, but uh, they're doing it in a way that uh, that makes it possible, yep. um, which is why no other <clears throat> game did it because it required a lot of effort. Yep, yeah. absolutely, and that, that's the thing about Sony, and that's the, one of the reasons I, I I think they're going to be the kings of content creation for at least like the next five to ten years is that they just understand the architecture. Really? Oh yeah, they just understand the architecture of their hardware so well, um, and they share that knowledge between all the other like teams. Um, which Microsoft, I mean, like to, to their credit, they tried to do these initiatives where like, hey, we're building on the Xbox. This is how you use this platform. But um, you, there was like all these, I don't want to like, get too negative. But there's like these egos involved where like people didn't want to give their secrets for the game they were working on to another group within Microsoft because they were afraid that would suddenly give them an edge on what they're working on. But Sony, like my understanding is Sony doesn't have that practice. Their mentality is like, if a team is doing something successfully they should be putting themselves in a position where they're uh, accessible to other sony developers so that product can be as successful as that company that figured out how to do it and that's one of the reasons naughty dog is such a like a master of their craft is that they're they're finding out all these technical and like these cutting edge solutions to building content on these platforms and then my understanding is that then they just share it with like the rest of the developers and that i think that that level of creative freedom and collaboration is why their products hold up so well. And that, I think that's the reason why mm. so many of the Microsoft products, even though they're acquiring studio after studio, just feel kind of like disjointed and you're, you don't understand like why is this company owned by Microsoft, but it doesn't hold up to the visual quality of this other Microsoft product is because they're not talking. Um, they need to break down those barriers. Oh, really? They need to remove wow. that, that ego and like start finding ways of being able to have cross collaboration to empower each other that way they can compete with a bigger company like Sony. Yeah. Mm, true, true. And I remember you also telling me that, um, uh, for going back to the Uncharted um, Naughty Dog mm -hmm. example, that they um, they did something to, that they worked with Sony to understand the hardware or change the hardware or something mm -hmm. so that they could make their game basically as optimized and realistic as it was. I can't remember what you're telling me about. Yeah, that, I actually learned that from, God, it, was, it was a document, I think it was a GDC doc. And uh, I don't remember the guy, like he, he actually left uh, Naughty Dog recently and he's like doing a bunch of tech art. But yeah, he was pretty much saying like, they, they work directly with uh, the hardware manufacturers to figure out how they can manipulate how the data was being um, written and read. That way they could actually start doing things like faster loading, um, have better audio, and it was really that collaboration between the hardware developers and the software developers that made that product so successful. And um, mm. I'll tell you what, like over the the ten years I was at Microsoft, there was never a conversation between us and the hardware developers. Um, and it makes mm. complete sense why you'd want to have that that forum and that 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 infrastructure in place of being able to talk to these people because who's going to know the hardware the best? The people that actually architected it. They're going to be able to tell you almost within like seconds, this is why you want to author something this way. If you want to bend the rules for authoring content, this is how the hardware is working behind the scenes. Um, and right, right. Yeah, I just recall like maybe I just wasn't in the right meetings. Like like oftentimes we were we were relearning how to build content on the Xbox. We were working on uh, Halo Four. And it was like, it was crazy. <laughs> we were like, someone has to know this yeah, stuff. Like, little, how do we not have contact crazy. to the guys who understand this hardware? Um, yeah. Yeah. That is, that is wild, isn't it? Yeah, yeah you, you, outside a company, you sort of imagine it, you know, like Microsoft is this entity. They must all be talking, working, talking, you know, they must, that, they must be able to crush it because they've got the hardware and the software teams 
under the same umbrella, but depending on the company's structure, the org, oh. the culture, it can be the opposite. Uh, it, it is absolutely. <laughs> and that's not just for Microsoft. It's, you know, I've heard the similar things at Google and other, when, when companies reach certain sizes, it's, uh, it almost becomes nearly impossible yep. to control the culture. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah, and I, I, I um, am sympathetic and empathetic to these big company structures. I understand they, they often have to generalize. They have to like put in these rules yeah. and generalize like hiring org structures because it's just too much data to try to manage uniquely. Um, and I just know when I, when I was there, I'm hoping they fixed it. But uh, when I was working there, like uh, 343, the same hiring org that they had for 343 was exactly the same hiring org they had on uh, the Windows platform. And it, it's, it's nuts, nuts to think about. So to put it in context, Ooh. like the, the way it worked is like um, for every five employees, you have to have a manager. And then for every five managers, you have to have a manager of that, those managers. And you can kind of understand, like, kind of see like how it starts building up. And then, like, for every five of those managers, managers, you have to have another manager. And the reason they did that is like they needed a level of accountability when they were building Windows operating systems, and it was very code driven. Um, but the mm. thing that I remember hitting time and time again, even on the production of Halo Four, is like we were like, hey, we need uh, a couple heads opened. We need at least three people to get this job done. Three artists, and they're like, well, here's the problem: is if we hire try to hire three artists, we are going to hire one artist and then we're gonna to have to hire another manager to be able to manage over the idea of like hiring on more people, but you won't have enough budget to do that because you'll hire that one artist, you'll hire that one manager and you won't have any more budget to hire on two more people. So oftentimes we had to do without hiring on those uh, additional artists because we didn't have the head count to be able to hire on more people. And it was just simply because they used the same hiring structure from Windows on a gaming um, platform, which doesn't make sense. Um, mm. So those are like some of the, the draconian things that happen yeah. from a bigger company standpoint that, once again, I, I sympathize, I empathize, but I'm like, people just need to understand that like, oftentimes the, the developers of a game are hamstrung based off the company that they're working at. And that's one of the reasons that they're not able to do everything that they oftentimes commit to simply because of like these draconian mm -hmm. methodologies that in this case, Microsoft established it for headcount uh, dispersion. So it's just crazy. Mm, yeah. And it, it's not unique to Microsoft. Yeah, Google has this, Amazon has this, and it's just one of those things that, yeah, exactly. They just need to kind of wake up and realize like games are different and there, there probably should be a precedence to have a different hiring structure for games specifically outside of software development. Yeah, it's right. I, I follow uh, Paul Graham on Twitter, and he said something very true recently, which is like all organizations uh, naturally gravitate towards bureaucracy and mediocrity. And it's up to the founder and the CEO to be aggressively pushing in the other direction, or else you will eventually, if, you, if nothing happens, it will just eventually become this gridlock <clears throat> system where people aren't talking, things aren't happening, and everything is just mediocre mm -hmm. because that's just naturally what happens. You end up putting in rules because of one situation that happened, and then, okay, everybody has to follow this rule, mm -hmm. and then five years later, people are going, why do we even have this rule? It doesn't make any sense, yep. you know? But like, there's so um, many things like already predicated crazy. on that rule that you can't get rid of it, and then you're like, yes. why do I even yeah, bother trying right. to move this initiative forward or why do I try to uh, encourage people to adopt this new practice because I have all this other like legal jargon uh, like fighting against me and they, they call that in the, in the bigger right. companies right. like red tape I have all this red tape holding me back I'm only one person why should I even bother trying to suggest something new that is cutting edge and that, that's honestly that's right. one of the reasons yeah. I, I left Microsoft is I like the idea of the smaller teams that didn't have all this red tape and you could be more agile. Like you could have people that mm. are brand new to the company, suggest amazing ideas and push forward amazing initiatives because you don't have to worry about what five managers up think of this idea coming from a person who's only been with the company for th three months. So. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, okay, so let's, let's dive back into a little bit more game yeah. dev then. So if you uh, wanted to develop a game efficiently today, mm -hmm. 
and it was your money, how would you go about creating the content knowing that you need lots of content created by lots of artists? Mm -hmm. Uh, so the the first thing I would do is I'd spend a, a big part of my resources on graphics programmers and technical artists. Um, I okay. I can't tell you what's a graphics program. A graphics programmer, uh, the way I, I I've worked with them, the people I've worked with are they can do a lot of different things, but primarily their job is to focus on building shaders that are shared out with the in this case the the art team that are as optimized as possible. And their sole job is to get that shader that they've developed to run as fast as humanly possible. Um, and if they're doing their job well, they understand that, okay, I can use instance shaders, I can use batching. And what that means is you can start getting visual permutations off that one shader type, um, and you can render more content in your scene at that higher rate. So they, their, their job at the end of the day is like, what you see on the screen, like all the shaders that are being used to render that that single frame is running efficiently because of that person dedicated the time and effort to figure out how do I render this stuff in an efficient manner. Um, and then... Right, so it's the foundation <clears throat> essentially of the optimization step, yes. really. Yeah, and far too many people... And then what's a technical artist? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, they're, they're, before you go to technical artists, their sole job is to make sure that you have a solid foundation that everyone's utilizing to get the the most out of the hardware as possible. And the places that end up floundering, mm -hmm. places that end up failing is because they over prioritize visual art and they under prioritize the technical aspect of how to get that artwork running effectively. Um, mm -hmm. And then a technical artist is typically an artist, uh, well, they, they typically a person who started off as an artist that has some coding background that eventually ends up uh, being that liaison between uh, this is what it means to uh, build code and then this is how that relates to art production. So they are really the people that come in and say, okay, well, when uh, Justin, the graphics programmer, says you need to lower your draw calls, the technical artist is like, this is how that relates to art creation. To lower draw calls, you need to hypothetically create texture atlases or you need to use the same shader with the same settings on more assets. That way we can actually batch this stuff together. It's like really uh, mm. conveying the, the relationship between when you make an art adjustment, this is what's happening to the performance of your product. And making that very clear at the very beginning to the artist, like this is why you don't wanna do X. Even though you can bend the rules in this, this is why you wanna minimize uh, transparency. This is why you don't wanna use the full spectrum of uh, resolution because when we start adding um, DDS files, which are just like clamp textures, this is like the, the format that game engines use to be able to render stuff. When you start creating mitmaps okay. and using DDSs, that's why your content's not gonna hold up is because you're using too wide of a, uh, a value range or spectrum range for these textures. Like they're really the Bible that you can go to to ask technical questions on asset creation and they should be able to guide you down the path of like don't do this if you're trying to do like a, a physics uh, particle if you're trying to do destruction if you're trying to build a wide open scene they should be able to give you guidelines on if you want to build an open world city these are the creative sacrifices you need to know about and you need to agree to up front if you want it to run and hit the framework you're looking for um, and uh, a lot of the stuff I focus right. on. Are they part of the scoping step? Like, <clears throat> you know, like, okay, we've got a character who needs to carry a basket. Like, what's the efficient way to make this basket? Are they, are they that hands-on, or is it more like at the start they're setting some rules? If you have, well, at the very start, they should be setting rules and setting up uh, pretty much best practices and pipelines. Like, hey, if you're building textures, these are how the textures need to be uh, set up, clamped, optimized, depending on every texture type you have. Um, if you guys are using shaders, these are the shaders you should be using. Um, and it, it sounds it sounds almost like very um, clinical, the work they do, mm. and it can be often stifling yes. to artists because, like, if you're if you're a freelance artist, you kind of do whatever you want to when it comes to shader creation, as long as it looks good. Yeah. Um, but oftentimes there's additional overhead. They're the guys who clip the wings. Yeah, exactly right. They come in there. Nope, 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 like, nope, nope. You, 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 can, you can still fly, but you're going to be more of a glider than someone who's flapping your wings. 
Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. They, they're really meant there to be uh, hold people accountable and to educate the artists that oftentimes don't have a technical background why things are are fundamentally not working on their end. They'll come in and do performance analysis. They'll play through spaces. They'll do a bunch of performance capturing of like, hey, this is why you have dropped frames here. And then they'll break it down. They'll be like, hey, you have dropped frames in these areas because you have too many particles here. So try reducing your particle count by half. You have uh, uh, too too many reflective objects here or too much just transparency in general here. If you reduce it by a third, you should be able to hit your frame rate. And so they're able to very discreetly with almost like a scalpel precision say, if you do X, Y, and Z in this location, you'll be able to hit your frame rate again. Um, Mm. And then Mm. I think you... You probably know. That's really interesting what you said. It, it, it's, it's like it's bridging the gap between the, the hardware and the art. Because as you said, artists aren't technical, which is so yes. true. And they, they, they don't know the geeky technical, how draw calls work and all that kind yeah. of thing. And it does kind of feel constraining. But if you just let the artists create their own game, it would be unplayable. Yes. It'd be beautiful. <laughs> Nobody could pick it up. It'd be beautiful, yeah. but unplayable. Yeah. I mean, and th- there is a time and place for that. I mean, I played my fair share of Mist, and like if you remember Mist back in the day, it's like oh, we have a yeah. pre-rendered background, and this is the only thing I can see until I move into the next area, and we have a pre-rendered background. You can make successful games like that if you don't have the frame rate you need, but <laughs> it's not going to be an enjoyable experience, and I think you're going to have a lot of angry uh, community members like, hey, like what's going on here, guys? Like, <laughs> Give me a little bit more. Yes. Um, Exactly. But yeah, that, yeah, that's the yeah. other thing that schools and bless their soul. That that's one of the reasons like the school structure just doesn't really work very well. It's like they teach artists how to do art, and you can be successful if that that's the only thing you want to do is create art. But the moment you start getting into a field like art creation, like games, film, there's it's 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 mm-hmm. almost like over prioritizing technical uh, limitations, and oftentimes artists don't want to deal with that. They're like. I don't want to build something with less than 5,000 polys. I don't want to have a limitation of a, a mm-hmm. 512 texture. And they don't understand, like, you can still make compelling content even though you have artistic restrictions. You just have to understand how to bend the rules, how to overlap UV shells, how to repurpose tiling textures to make that limitation into an actual artistic mm-hmm. boon. And... and- it, I remember like feeling the same. Like it's like I'm being constrained. I don't. In fact, that was actually why I never really got into game creation, game development, mm-hmm. was because it felt like a constraint um, that everything has to be optimized. And it's all it's all technical, mm-hmm. and I'm like, no, nah, I just want to be able to build stuff. Um, and, until I I learned that in every field, the greatest artists, the greatest musicians, the greatest directors, the the ones who succeed, the job is to work within constraints. That's the difference between good artists and bad artists is every artist imagines that they'll just have a job where they they can do anything they want. And it's never the case. Like I was listening to um, an interview with, uh, I think it was Robert Rodriguez, the the director um, who I think is, I I don't think I've actually seen some of his films, but very famous. And he was saying that for his first film, which had like a budget of ten thousand dollars or something, which is nothing, um, they were using crappy tripods, right? Nothing, nothing for a film, to make it's a feature film. I don't even know if it's possible today. Um, and it, they had these crappy tripods on set, and they just couldn't afford. They didn't have the budget for better tripods, and it meant that when they were trying to dolly or uh, pan, pan the camera yep. across, pan across that it had this jagged motion and they literally couldn't pan the camera. They couldn't do it for the shots. And they're like, what do we do? So he, he developed, he, he just said, we're just gonna have to do whiplash cuts and make it stylized. So that when the one character's talking and then it, and then it switches to the next character, and then it goes back to the other one. And that became something that fans loved. Mm-hmm. People were like, it's such a unique style. And then people actually ended up emulating that mm-hmm. because it was so unique. And he's like, it was just because we had shitty tripods, yeah. <laughs> you know? But the, the difference between uh, somebody who sees that constraint and goes like, oh, well, I just can't, you know, that's why this was shit. Like, we couldn't pan it because it was, you know, we, had, we just didn't have the budget for it. No one wanted to buy it versus somebody who works around it and tries to figure out how can you operate within the constraints 
that's that's everything. Yes. Um, and, and that's also how you end up with original ideas. Yes. Is you try to look for those opportunities. And um, it, it's kind of fun. Like when I was recently making this Earth tutorial, we were originally looking at doing it with EV. And it was like, yeah, how can you make EV, which is this real-time renderer for Blender, how can you make it look as good as Cycles? And you're trying to like optimize it. And like, what is the refresh? Like, what does this level of texture do to the render time? What is this level of, you know? And it, it is quite fun because you end up with something that can be, you've hacked it enough that you can get a result that people have never seen before. Yes. And they go, how did you get that to run in real time? Which is, um, which is quite fun. Absolutely. Anyway, and that, that's actually, uh, honestly, that's like one of the funnest parts of art creation for me is learning those technical limitations and proving to people that I can still create something that is impactful, it's valuable, people like will be inspired by the product I'm making even with these mm. restrictions. And if you can find mm -hmm. enough people like that, there's nothing you can't do. Um, like mm -hmm. yeah. I, I've often gone into interviews and I've talked with people and I've interviewed people that are like, well, I kind of refer to them as unicorns that ha you can, you know, almost immediately that they have that mentality and they see the possibilities where others don't. Um, and oftentimes they get overlooked because of like, uh, they don't have a fancy resume or whatever. And I, I can tell you right now, you will learn more from people like that than uh, industry professional in the industry for like 20 years, simply because they are not burdened mm. by what is possible based off these restrictions. They see what is potentially possible by working around these limitations. Mm, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's fun. It's fun. It, it does require a mind shift to go from the artist who wants everything to be perfect, mm -hmm. and but it is fun when you get there. And it also feels like maturing. Like now I'm taking this seriously because mm -hmm. you you can't put it off forever. Like pretend that you'll never have to optimize things. Of course, you want to get a job, like you know. Yeah. Um, but anyways, that was a, a bit of a tangent. Yeah. Um, so going back, so you, we were talking about if you were developing a game efficiently, mm -hmm. um, you you said you'd start with graphics programmer yep. and technical technical artist artists yep yep and then yep. Um, and go from there. once you once you have those uh, those two positions and oftentimes it's more than like technically if you want to be a really successful you're probably going to have a couple of graphics programmers you can have a couple of technical artists that can help educate the rest of the team that you have yet hired and then from there what you're okay. really looking for is people that don't have egos, people that have a proven track rec record of being able to work with a group of people and putting them into a position of power that oftentimes they've never been given the opportunity to. Um, I kind of refer to it as okay. finding people that have been put into uh, positions of like cogs where they've been asked to do the same thing day in, day out. They're just kind of collecting paychecks even though they're very prolific on the side. Finding people that can show a range of skill sets that are also not afraid to share that knowledge in an open interview. Um, if you go mm. into an interview and you start like digging into like, how'd you build this? How'd you do this? And like you find people that are private, like they don't want to tell you how it's made. You should watch out for that because like that immediately tells you that this individual is not willing to mentor and educate yeah. your team members. Um, because that's really what you're that's looking for. True. You're looking for someone who's going to be that communicator that is able to talk to you. And we're really talking about an art director. We're talking about an art lead at the end of the day, what we're really talking about filling a head for. And that this individual needs to be able to proactively ask questions to the graphics programmers, tell them what he's trying to achieve, work with the technical artists of like, okay, now that we understand like what we're trying to achieve, how do I actually build a pipeline or infrastructure to uh, educate the artists on and then if you can get those three heads filled then you it's gonna sound horrible then you can actually start hiring uh, entry level people to fill more veteran level positions because you've already solved a lot of the technical challenges of production now you just need people that are able mm -hmm. to have an artistic eye that can actually uh, build content at a reasonable cadence and even if it's not the best artwork in the world you will find out that they can make oftentimes better looking content because they know the technical limitations that the technical artist has told them than an industry professional that doesn't know any of that stuff. Um, mm. And that, that's the thing that is keep on teaching people is like, if you, if you solve the technical, the artistic stuff just like it falls into place. Then it's just like a matter of hours. How many hours do I have? How many assets do I need to build? 
and then you just put people in the seats and build that stuff out. And that, unfortunately or fortunately, the way you look at it, that's one of the reasons they outsource artwork is because if they have a mm. solid internal team that understands the technical stuff, then you just send out documents, you send out these the assets I need made, and you're going to get back oftentimes 90% of what you're looking for. And that, that 10% that mm. doesn't hit the quality bar, that's why you have higher fidelity artists internally that can actually elevate that content. Um, mm. Right, right. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So the so th that that's why, uh, and when you talking about the art, you're talking about the concept art, using an outsourced. Yeah, you can you can outsource concept yeah. art. You can outsource models. I mean, the most uh, the most common thing that I experienced that Microsoft was outsourcing models in entire environments. Uh, you you give mm. what they call proxy environments to external vendors, and like proxy, just think like square blocks or cubes that represent like the map. And then you just give them like mm. a handful of concepts saying, okay, this is what this is supposed to look like. It's supposed to look like a blue environment with a bunch of jagged rocks, think volcanoes. And then it's up to that external vendor then to build all the assets and replace the proxy assets with final artwork. And then mm, got it, got <clears throat> provided it. that the technical artist has, has done his job and educated the external vendor correctly, then all the content you're getting back is already performant. And then the last step of it, that last 20%, which all, almost always takes just as long as the other 80, then it's just polish, okay. it's just elevating it. And then you find out like, hey, because we're frugal, like super frugal up front, we can actually start flipping mm. switches that we normally wouldn't be able to do. You can start talking about post effects, bloom, anti-aliasing, uh, physics, mm, particle effects. Right. And I'll tell you what, like a scene with and without particle effects, I think most people, when they see that comparison, will always choose uh, a scene that has dumbed down environment props to be able to support the particle effects in that because it adds a sense of movement, life, and immersion. Whereas if you just, Is that right? oh yeah. Whereas if you just over prioritize just that. doing okay. amazing artwork, you may not have the budget to do effects. So. It's, that's one of the reasons you want to be so frugal from an environment creation standpoint so you can afford all those bells and whistles that really showcase the art. Wow. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It, it, yeah, that's another reason to go optimized because mm -hmm. then if you've, done, if you've done the hard work, if you've done your homework and it's optimized as it can be, then you can start flicking switches, mm -hmm. as you said. And doing things that people are like, how did you get that to run? Yes. <laughs> Which is cool. It's really fun. And that, that, that's, that's the cool. best okay, part. Okay, so let's. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, okay, let, let's talk about. Um, let's say you were developing, and you had to develop the content internally, yep. uh, and author it internally. And it's a, you know, it's a street, New York street or something. It's got trash. It's got cars. Mm -hmm. It's got buildings, um, and you've got to lead a team of artists to develop that content. Yes. Um, how do you ensure that it is done as cheaply as possible to the standards that you need and that it doesn't go over budget? Yeah, yeah the, the, the first thing, and like I, I did this through the production of Republic, I did this through the Repub uh, production of Iron Man, and uh, I'd probably say it's the most successful I've ever been from an art directing standpoint. And the first thing you do is you actually have the people working on that level do a lot of asset vetting. Um, so this kind of gets back to uh, people's perceptions of spaces. Like everyone has a different idea of what a dirty scene is. Everyone has a different idea of what a human is. So the first thing you do is like you give that concept or that series of concepts to the artist and you say, I want you to curate a list of assets that you see in this that you think are the most important. And you have every one of the mm -hmm. artists do this. And okay. then what happens is um, once they do this, and normally the, this, uh, this trial run or this investigation takes about a week because you want to have them be very thorough and you want them to find the things that they think are the most important. And you don't want to rush this process because if you get false information up front, it's going to end up tarnishing your entire production schedule later on because you might be over prioritizing something that's not important. So at the mm -hmm. end of that week, you get all those artists together and then you pretty much throw all their images into Miro all in Pure Ref. And then you kind of have like this collage and then you just sit there with them like hey this okay. is interesting like who else uh, chose this boulder who else chose this car who else chose this lamp and then you immediately find out like what is the most important thing because people have called out common elements and those are the really? things that okay. are the most important in that scene or those concepts in their eyes and then oftentimes you'll you'll find like 
uh, maybe like five or six things that others didn't see or others didn't notice. And then suddenly everyone else says like, oh, actually, that manhole cover is actually pretty important. Those uh, particle effects or that mist coming from that is actually important. And then you end up curating your final list of assets from that. So if you were to imagine, uh, I think at the largest peak, we had, I think, 10 artists. We went from roughly 150 assets, and we were able to curate the, those assets down to 50 important assets that if we did not have those assets for that, that illustration or that environment would compromise the overall feel. So that's what you then mm. focus on. You focus on building those 50 assets. You throw that in there because that's the most important stuff. And then you're, you're in that sweet position of like, okay, well, I've just contextualized probably about 80% of this concept and it's already feels like the concept because we focused on the most important elements as a team. And then the rest of the mm. time, you can start focusing on, on the secondary and tertiary elements that frankly don't add that much, but it, by adding that stuff in there, it just makes it feel lived in it makes it feel like uh, more immersive. And that's where you actually start getting some of these story elements, the storytelling elements is with that other uh, tertiary, uh, tertiary elements of that. And the best part about it is like you have the time to build that because you weren't having people aimlessly try to find out what is important in the scene. Everyone already found that mm. out during the first week of development. Um, and a lot that's of studios really don't do that. I haven't heard of that. Yeah. Mm. A lot of studios don't do that. They, and they so, just give you a concept, say, build this concept, and you're like, okay, I, mean, I guess I'm just going to build everything. I'm going to build everything. Nuts and, bolts. and then that's why you end up blowing yeah. past your timelines. It's like <laughs> they focus on all this, like the, the small details, because most artists at the end of the day are prop artists that end up turning yeah, into right. environment artists. And uh, what happens when you're put under stress? You fall onto old habits, and old habits being, I'm a prop artist, so I'm just going to focus small and then go large. Whereas in most cases, wow, you should be going true. really broad Large. and then working down to the, the finer details. It's very <clears> true. And then the, the other criteria That's I'd end really up giving them that we kind of glossed over is um, you give them a budget. Like, hey, um, initially when you're doing this, you're allowed hypothetically 10 materials. They can be tiling materials. They can be trim sheets. But you're only allowed 10 materials. You can be as creative with regards to that restriction as possible. But that is the limitation. And then they start realizing like, oh, there's relationships here. Like, uh, I, I need a metal. I can use this metal on the car. I can use this metal on the lamppost. I can use this metal on the ground. But then I can make the lamppost look different because I can place decals on it or I can add uh, mm. a, a layered shader, shader to it to help ground it. Um, so then you start mm. like, and this kind of goes back to why a tech course is so important by only having hypothetically 10 materials up front, you only have hypothetically, worst case scenario, 10 draw calls for your scene. Mm. And that kind of gets back mm -hmm. to the performance element. So you're, you're, you're actually having your artists be very, um, it's, it's not, it's weird. It's like, it's, it, you're, I'm almost playing like a shell game with them. I'm having them build content very efficiently up front and they don't even realize it because they're focusing on the technical challenge of, I have this shader limitation and I have a prop limitation. That's how, where I need to focus my effort. So they're thinking artistically, even though they're solving a technical issue of performance and how I build content efficiently. So that's exactly mm. where you want to be. You want to have people focusing on creating art if they're an artist and not worrying about the limitations, even though you secretly snuck the limitations in their form. Right, right, right. Got it. Yeah. Oh, that's really clever. Yeah, it's so interwoven, isn't yes. it? It's like... Yeah, the, the the materials. It's right. Like to to get that, you got the concept art of this dirty New York scene, and there's a hundred ways you could go about creating it. And if the technical programmer and the uh, oh no, not the te graphics, graphics programmer. programmer, the technical, if that hasn't been outlined, the budgets and like you could just end up with like the artist ended up using an insanely huge texture for the road mm -hmm. because they needed the detail mm -hmm. of the uh, individual cigarette butts and things. It's like. Yeah, that could have been a decal, as yes. you said, you know. Yeah, and the, you yeah. don't know that unless you actually have someone who's educated in, like, how the hardware runs that when those uh, – where, where those issues actually are. I mean, uh, you and me were kind of talking about this uh, several months ago. Um, there's a tool – I think it's owned by Unity now called Artimatrix. And their whole tool philosophy is, like, yes. we can take – Automatics. Automatics, yeah. They can actually take these images, yep. and you can just, like, feed it into the system, and it generates this huge texture for you. 
and it looks great. And you're like, yeah, that looks great. If if I can create a game where I can use 16K textures to get the visual permutation to represent that distance, yeah, that just looks great. But the moment you start saying, like, I want to have a, a repeating 256, but I still want to feed it these unique textures, you start realizing, like, oh, this is not really meant for games. This is meant for mm. film. This is meant for things that don't really have an artistic limitation to it. And then you start realizing like a lot of the tools out there are catering to people that just don't know any better. And they, they think mm, they're getting like yeah. this, this magical solution or this golden egg that's going to save them. And then they don't realize the, the technical limitations of what they're actually building. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Cause I really wanted that tool to be like that successful thing. And then you're like, Oh no, like <laughs> obviously yeah. this is not what you guys have uh, sold it as. Okay. I kind of feel like a, Full spill of goods here. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, there's a, I mean, that's, again, it's sort of like good product is talking to customers and a lot of companies just don't want to do no. it <laughs> because it's too, it's annoying. you got to reach out. There's a rejection element. There's a... Uh, Differing it's opinions. It's time consuming. And then it, it, it also, there's, yeah, there's ego involved. It's like you end up with like, you know, the product manager or the head just going like, we know what people want. Mm. Like, is this? And it's like, yeah, you just haven't spoken to him yet. That's all. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, that's uh, okay. Uh, so we're talking about the street. <clears throat> You've, you're focusing on a few assets, yep. the key assets. Now, are you just like, I don't know, you got reference photo and there's, I don't know, like just like nuts and bolts sitting on the ground or something next to a step. Mm-hmm. And it's like, are you just, you, you're also culling things. Is that right? This isn't necessary. This isn't necessary. Yes. Yeah, you set up priorities. Yeah. Like you, you set up pretty much like what are the most important elements. And uh, a good art director isn't the one like dictating that. Um, a, a good art director allows the creators to call that stuff for him. And then if he sees something that was overlooked, or if he feels like suddenly the direction is like deviating too much from the the initial concept or the direction of the story, he's able to very quickly rein them in or redirect them. Um, and there, there's studios like all over the place. Like I've seen like a wide range of different art directors. Like some art directors are very draconian. We're like, nope, it has to be this way from start to finish. They have final say. They pretty much like make every decision. And they have a very stressful life. I do not envy them. And then there's other art directors mm-hmm. that just like, like the way I art, I art direct is like, I want to find people that are talented, that are able to carry just as much weight as me. And that don't know what I, what, what, uh, that know what I don't know. And if you find mm. those people to kind of be supplemental to your workflow, then you're going to have far fewer um, curveballs. You're going to have far fewer issues later on because you have all these unique-minded individuals coming together for a common goal. And it's mm. it's very rare to kind of like build a structure like that. Uh, at least because yeah. like I mean, you can only learn so much from a resume. Oftentimes, people hire friends on uh, with the idea of, like this guy's a really cool guy, not realizing that they're toxic in a work environment. And it, it, it's, there, <laughs> yep. it's very difficult to kind of manage that. But uh, yeah, but when it comes definitely. to um, the art director, in theory, should really be focusing on the entire experience. They're focused on the for, the entire forest. And then everyone else that is building the environment is focused on the trees, the, the bushes, the grass, and like the smaller elements. And it's really an open conversation that each one of those individuals should be having with each other about what is the most important thing. And if there's ever a situation mm-hmm. where there's a conflict, where like uh, we, we're starting to get to the point where like we're nearing the end of a scene, people don't know what to work on next, you kind of, you, you reset. So you, uh, at the very beginning of the cycle, mm-hmm. we talked about, uh, here's these concept images, you guys choose the top like 50 assets, and then that's what we focus on. Once you kind of get that to the point where people are serving the grasp of stars of what's the most important thing, you do a reset, you bring in concept artists if you have them, to do paint overs of the space to help like suggest, okay, well, this is where we can push the space, but you also have them, um, the environment team, look at the concepts again, reevaluate what's the most important thing, reevaluate what is missing. And then you, at the end of the week, you look at once again, like that kind of collage board, what are the common themes or the common elements people are calling out? And then you refocus on that because you're, you're gonna find out in, off, in most cases, there's only about five to maybe 20 things that everyone has complete agreement on with regards to why that space is lacking and what it needs. And then you build those 20 elements. 
and you put it in there and then you're going to find mm-hmm. out that it was just those 20 elements it wasn't a cre- complete rebuild it wasn't the wrong mood of the scene it was just that there's uh, a few missing narrative beats or uh, uh, focal points in that composition what is why it didn't really hold up and why it didn't really wasn't successful at that point in time but you're almost never that mm-hmm. far off the mark because you've already kind of did your due diligence and you've hired the right people to kind of curate as you go yeah, yeah got it. that makes sense wow well uh we've uh we've almost hit the two hour mark but i do want to get into uh post camouflage yes. and uh joining us here at polygon so what are you doing at polygon uh so uh i left camouflage this year um i think it was march time frame and uh i happened to <laughs> Oddly enough, I was a huge admirer of uh, the Blender Guru, the the work you've been doing, Andrew. And uh, it was just like this, I think we even had this during the interview loop. It was like this weird culmination of, I was watching a lot of your videos. I just happened to see a random post about like a company you had on the side called Polygon. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't realize that was a thing. <laughs> and then I saw that you had a position open for more or less an art director that uh, during the interview loop, we, we talked openly, and I was like, I don't think you're looking for an art director. I think what you're really looking for is an asset director, someone that can come in that's mm. not going to necessarily change the artistic direction that, of your product because it was already solid, but it is more able to come in, kind of call out like, hey, this is studio-level production. This, these are the kinds of generalities you can infuse into your workflow to spit out content faster at a higher quality bar, and kind of like, what well, kind of like bring it back to like what we talked about, like think creatively with regards to restrictions, but still be able to hit a high quality bar because of that. Um, so that's what mm-hmm. I've kind of been doing mm-hmm. since I've joined. Like I've come in, uh, I'm working with a lot of talented uh, managers, Rob, Macy, and Christoph. And together we're really just analyzing every aspect of production and trying to figure out what are, what's unnecessary um, methodologies that the current company currently has that we can kind of remove from the process to make artists life easier. But what are also industry standard techniques that are being used today in uh, previs in real time that we can start adopting to make the content more palatable to more people in the industry from film to games to freelance artists. And it's really just like taking the content to the, the next level from a professional standpoint. So that's been the main yeah, focus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Polygon sort of started, um, yeah, it was eight years ago, which is wild to think about, as a, uh, you know, just like I, I was making Blender tutorials, I was using textures, and I was like, why don't I just offer my own textures that have all the maps in them, because otherwise people have to generate their mm-hmm. own. So that was the whole thing. And then it was like, what about models? And it was that the standards weren't set, you know? And a, a, as you can imagine, you can end up with, some models that have like lots of subdivision and lots of polys and then there are others that are lighter and it ends up with a bit of a disconnect and also you can end up with assets that just cost way too much to produce um we've we've done rough math on some of our past releases and you know some of the assets come out to like 10 grand each um because of the r and d that went into it just like so overblown in budget um and yeah yeah having you here has been as you said good setting some industry standard practices and jira mm-hmm. tell us about jira what what what, what does jira <laughs> help with we've moved that entire company jira. to jira yeah yeah <laughs> this is where people start like flipping to a, a new video so <laughs> so jira is uh <laughs> it, it's very common in in the the game industry at least over my career uh, most studios have their own version of Jira, but it's it's a way of tracking asset creation and really focusing on standardization. So Jira is a tool that I've helped uh, Polygon sh- switch over to that allows us to have a very curated pipeline from start to finish that has discrete focus. So um, if you were to think about it, just think of these individual modules. Module one is idea phase, where we're able to generate a bunch of ideas uh, pie in the sky, open world, anything goes. And then we have our second board, which is our production board. And to be able to get those ideas into production, we have to have some checks and balances that happen before that content goes into production. And a lot of it's not fun. A lot of it's like, 
can we build this at a cost-effective manner? This very aspirational thing that has been proposed, do we have the tools at our disposal? Do we know how to build this in a, a timely manner? And do we understand the technical limitations of that and being very specific with regards to what success is? And success for us is just making sure that however much time and money we put into something, we have a level of certainty by the time it's released that we can recoup that cost within a year. That's the most important thing. Mm. And if you can't do that, yeah. like there will be situations where we call them like we call them glam, glam pieces or hero props that we know we're never going to make. Uh, we're never going to break even, at least not in the first year. But we do that because we understand that there's international appeal. There's something that everyone's asking for that we have to be able to provide to stay competitive, but more importantly, provide the content that a lot of community members need. And mm -hmm. even if it's like one out of like 100 people that use it, we're providing that unique assets because we know that there's appeal. Uh, but that's that's mm -hmm. that, that's yeah. the exception to the rule, not the rule. The rule at, right now yeah. is... Let's build things in an efficient manner. Let's build compelling content that the majority of the industry needs in a timely manner so we can still be successful and Polygon can be around for years to come. Um, yeah, yeah. So exactly. we have module ideas, we have module production. Production is, as you would imagine, in Jira, just like a series of checks with like, hey, this asset is uh, being worked on. Once the asset's in done, it goes into a verification pass where the manager looks at it from a QA standpoint. Does it hit the quality bar? It, uh, does it look like the reference? And then provided that all those are kind of checked, then it goes into what we call deployment. Uh, deployment mm -hmm. is really just like the, the, the stuff that people take for granted. Uh, it's really, what is, what's the technical data? What is the information we're going to associate with this asset on the website to <laughs> allow people to understand like what this asset even is? Like it allows them to type in a quick mm -hmm. search and find that, oh, I typed in metal. I actually found the object I'm looking for. So it's metadata. It's keywords. Mm. It's uh, a meaningful description that people can search for on the internet and then find the asset they're looking for. So that's what the whole deployment phase yeah. is really focused around, SEO data. And then the last part of it yeah. is yeah. once we figure out and quantify that asset, we release it, and then we roll that asset into our marketing uh, phase or, or give it to the marketing division, and then they figure out the best way to promote that content. And normally it's illustrations. It's beautiful renders that help sell intent or help people understand like, hey, this is how you might be able to use this asset we released from a texture to a model. And it, hopefully if we're doing our job right, it shows the artist, the uh, company, this is one of the many possibilities of this asset. And it's ver oftentimes much more versatile than we even give it credit for. So yeah, this yeah. really gets back to, yeah, exactly. we're just trying to get people's artistic brains flowing when it hits marketing that way the community understands the possibilities of that asset and then it's rinse and repeat yeah, man exactly. it's like it, it goes back to the idea phase we um i don't know how much of this was actually really implemented at the beginning but like one of the things i just tell every person on the team it doesn't matter if you're a programmer an artist a uh, marketing person everyone has great ideas everyone knows uh something that'd be valuable to them and if they are willing to at least take the time of creating an idea board or a, a task and submitting it, there's the possibility that could actually turn into a full-fledged asset. No asset, no idea is a bad idea. Um, the only thing that stops an idea from being something like a reality is do we have the ability to build that in an efficient manner now? So mm, Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, – it, it's – it's a lot, but it's it's exciting to see because it's a lot of small changes happening. Uh, but basically, by the way, for the for the listeners, you're not caring about all this internal yeah. stuff. It's basically enable us to what so far like double output, right? Yeah, I mean uh, across the, with the same team. Yes, we're getting like double the number of assets out. It's now the last month was 110, yep. I think. Yep. Yeah, technically we fished that we would have had 40. Yeah, no, exactly. Like when I <laughs> when I look back on the the records, like uh, January was like forty, uh, February I think was like fifty ish, and then uh, there was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I think I told you this before <laughs> before I came on. Like if I come in and I do this and we start changing things, you you will see a production dip, and we did. I think we at one month we had like twenty, and simply because like we had to teach yep. people new tools, new methodologies, but. After that dip, we immediately went to, I think the initial release after that 20 was 180. And then I was like, okay, this is a bubble. <laughs> like, don't, don't, like, this is just beginning. This is a bit of a bubble because, like, we had some uh, brand deals at the same time. 
And then I think we stabilized at 80, 90, and then the last two months we've released 110, 100. Uh, and then the thing I was telling you uh, this month is that we technically finished 190 assets. It's just that we didn't have enough uh, priority set to reviewing content. So some of those assets got bottleneck in the review phase. So technically we finished 190, but we were only able to release 100 to be able to still maintain the quality we were shooting for. So we're definitely yeah, on the yeah. right track. We definitely have the right cadence. And I, I think yeah. it's, I don't want to to my own horn, but I think there is the definite possibility of breaking 200 in a given month, provided that we're able to solve Ooh. the bottleneck of reviewing content. And the best way to do that is once again, relying on our individual contributors, our artists, and telling them that you are more than just an artistic creator. You're, you have so much more to be able to provide to the company than just content. If you're willing to just like help with a review, if you're willing to take on tasks outside of what you're traditionally trained for, we're going to be able to like blow past our KPI goals uh, and record time. And I think we even mentioned this, like the, the amount of work we're able to do just in this month equates to what you guys were actually doing in the, uh, the first three months of this year, which is awesome. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's really cool. And it, uh, yeah, it means people get more relevant assets that they need more often. Yep. So, um, yeah, and it's uh, <clears throat> people who are wondering what's to come for Polygon. Um, Steven's experience with game dev will certainly come in handy next year as we start doing a massive uh, standards revamp <laughs> for the assets across the site. Um, but yeah, there's there's some very exciting things coming down the pipeline. So it's uh, great to have you with us, Stephen. Thank you. It's uh, it's been great. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I think that just about does it. Um, are you active anywhere on social media that people could follow you or hear your thoughts? Um. So I I mean I'm on Facebook, but that's not actually where I spend most of my time. I actually. I'm working on my own side project. It's been on the back burner for a while, while called Rusty Nail. And when that finally goes live, it's really going to be an educational platform teaching people a lot of the technical things that they do not learn in school. Uh, so when I release mm. my, uh, my videos, um, once again, I'm not going to put a timeline on it. It's going to happen when it happens. But the videos are yeah. primarily going to be focusing on a lot of the technical things that you should know going into game development that... Oftentimes, schools don't teach. So you're going to learn about tax density standards and how that relates to asset development. You're going to learn about uh, why having a uniform resolution from uh, every asset um, can in actually improve immersion in your products. You're going to learn about why poly density is important. You're going to learn about how to uh, optimize draw calls um, and just like really deep focus on, uh, frankly, technical art. Um, but also included in that, I'm going to have some courses about JIRA for asset management, if you ever want to do that on yourself. I'm going to have some courses on uh, version control, which version control, um, if, if you just want to kind of like have a high level understanding, is like, it's just a way of being able to store and manage assets that most big studios require you to utilize. So it's a database that all people use and submit content through. So I'm going to have some courses on version control because... When I'm building stuff for myself, I actually use uh, P4V, it's per force version control for managing all my stuff. And it's a great way of backing up your data, being able to be agile with it. And if you're using it uh, from a freelance standpoint and you decide to go to a bigger company like Microsoft, I guarantee you will be using version control in those companies. And it's just good to understand mm -hmm. what that limitation is and what the best practices are. So that's interesting. Yeah. And that, that hasn't, <clears throat> you haven't seen any online course or institution teaching that no not really no i mean you, you can obviously no. go to p4 and see some videos on it but like no one's really teaching this stuff and the la it's sad mm. it's sad to say but the last video i i really did was for gdc it was like actually teaching physically based rendering a lot of it was like based off of the knowledge that i learned from west mcdermott and i re released some papers on that stuff a while ago but that at this point that's like five to six years old so it's due time that i wow. kind of revitalize that and start uh helping mentor people outside of my immediate bubble of peers and along with uh, uh, helping uh, ideally influence the industry with regards to where we can go from a technology standpoint. Yeah, man, that's great. It sounds like it's uh, definitely, I mean, I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll be a, I'll, I'll peruse your, uh, I'll, I'll be the first guinea pig to go through it. 
No, that'd be awesome. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. And then um, if you want to like use more formal portals, you can find me on LinkedIn. And then if you want to find me, like my personal website, it's steven-hower.com. Uh, so nice. that's where I have my Got portfolio. It. Awesome. Great. Well, Steven, it's been uh, great hearing all that. I'm sure it was new yeah. to a lot of people, <laughs> and that was wonderful. Thanks very much. No, no, thank you. It's been a blast, Andrew. <laughs>